Uh, we're a little bit late in today's show. We are going to be speaking with Matt Parrott in just a second. In fact, if um, if Matt is if Matt is with us, I don't know if Matt can hear me. I, I see him in the studio now. Talked to producer Ann earlier. She says, "Yeah, he's in the green room. I, he was uh, eating the caviar, getting into the the, the cookies." I, Matt, are you there? Uh, yeah. Hello, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah. Hey, what's Hello? up, man? How you doing? Hey, I'm good. How are you doing? Good morning over there in Montreal. Good morning. I uh, yeah, I just crawled up. I'm I'm a I'm a late the, the muse the creative muse tends to hit me usually around 1 a.m. or so so uh I'm, i tend to go to bed late at night and i just crawled out of bed but i'm i'm uh, i'm very very happy to join you uh as always so this is going to be i hope it's going to be interesting for for those listening oh definitely will um do you, um are you using the phone app or the desktop app desktop app should i be using um, my phone app well, if you've got headphones on, it should work all right. Like right now, it's not it's not coming through clearly. It is coming through clearly, actually. Yeah, I was just making sure that we. I was just trying to be preventative. I did hear there was a little bit of a of a little echo or whatever, um, but I think we're good, man. So um, thanks for jumping out of bed um, in the, the the very early hour of nine a.m. Um, but I'm glad, <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that you're with us reporting for duty. Um, you have a new documentary out, a, a short, a short film about China. Yes. Um, I've been sharing it. I've been promoting it on the channel. We're going to do it again after uh, we say goodbye. Um, tell us, tell us what was the question for folks who haven't watched it yet so we can get them interested in it. What was the main question that you wanted to explore that you, what was the main question that you, that you were curious about? And then when you found out you wanted to share with people and you got behind produce this documentary. Sure. Yeah. I mean, the, the, uh, the topic of the, the documentary was originally intended, intended to be, uh, one thing. It turned out to be something totally different than, than anticipated, um, it's it's actually episode three of an ongoing series. Right. Uh, a few months ago, um, my wife and I, Cynthia, Cynthia Chung and myself, we published a um, a special report to sort of help people focus uh, amidst the noise and the misinformation being spread, confusing the the zeitgeist, even not just in the mainstream media consumer base, but even something that is increasingly uh, really confused the alternative media consumer base of people trying to make sense of the world. And a lot of the people who follow our writings tend to be obviously MAGA-oriented um, or at least conservative, conservative-minded anti-Great Reset, obviously. But um, there's been a, a lot of fear porn and relatively sophisticated, sometimes not sophisticated at all, but it, there's been a, a lot of amplification of messaging and narrative reframing, neurolinguistic programming uh, to sort of Get everybody to hate and fear China and label China as the cause of all of our problems. So the the special report on the breaking free of anti-China psyops produced. I mean, we tried to tackle some of the core tropes. Um, we've got a, a volume two actually coming out next week on breaking free of anti-China psyops. You know, Uyghur concentration camps. Is it true or is it false? Uh, what about Falun Gong? You know, uh, organ eating. CPC, uh, militarists, are they, are, is that true? I mean, we're being told it's true. Is it true? Is there evidence for any of these things? Uh, police stations. That was actually the first video, uh, that we, that we turned, uh, from our book so that we adapted content from the, the special report into video content. We did a nine minute video on this, on the, the claims of Chinese police stations internationally, uh, where we were just able to debunk that, get across that. Now this is, entirely made up there's no evidence of any of this ever but we're um you know and it's easy to prove the second one go went into a, was another nine minute video just sort of dismantling the russia gate material and really just bring the the role of british intelligence specifically mi6 richard Dearlove, the same guy that brought us the dodgy dossier that that justified the war in iraq that that sort right. of brought that back in focus obviously robert uh, Mueller himself who carried out the witch hunt 
uh, was the director of the FBI while 9-11 was happening. He's the guy who integrated or integrated the FBI ever more deeply with MI5 when the MI5 director was brought in in the wake of 9-11. Mm-hmm. Um, complete overhaul of the FBI's uh, method- methodologies around MI5 methods. So, I mean, Mueller, uh, Richard Dearlove, who was the boss and probably still is the boss <laughs> of uh, uh, Sir, of Christopher Steele, uh, Christopher Steele having been the guy that brought us the Dodgy Dossier in the first place, or Dodgy Dossier number two. Um, so all of these these figures are often left out of the discussion in a lot of the American media channels that talk about this, whether Gateway Pundit or Epoch Times or anything. They they tend to focus on more of like some collusion with the FBI and the Democratic Party and Hillary is sort of like, you know, uh, seen as the, the great supervillain along with Soros. And the, the entire higher operating system of British intelligence, the Rhodes Scholar Network that's penetrated the United States for a century to reconquer the U.S., all of this is left out of the narrative, even the mm. acceptable narratives uh, for the the conservatives. So we mm. tried to really just bring that into focus. Um, and then for the current documentary, it turned out to be a lot more than we we thought it was going to be a little, like another easy little nine-minute piece, a little nine-minute video, kind of but fun to listen to. Like 27 to. minutes or something like that. Yeah, it grew and grew and grew. And I, we had to do a few rewrites. We, we've we been working with a, a very talented filmmaker in Ottawa that I met during the Freedom Convoy. He actually has his own podcast named Jason Dahl. And uh, and this guy's just – I've been i had been looking for somebody with this type of, of multimedia talent for a long time. And I was, I was beginning to despair because I've always wanted to make documentaries. And even when I was in school and university 20 years ago – I was trying to, I was, I was in film animation. I was trying, my focus was trying to figure out how to make documentaries. I, I ended up getting sidelined and getting pulled into more of a political, uh, path, but it's always been in the back of my mind. Uh, but I could never find anybody with the talent until I met this guy, Jason Dahl. So it's been able, it's given us the ability to turn a lot of our, our written content into something fun, especially for the younger audience who needs to sort of learn how to read again. And video right, is right. a nice good way. But <laughs> yeah, in the meantime, we happen. can make movies. Yeah. Let me ask you, um, and also let me, let me kind of so the audience understands what your what your relationship to China is. You're not a communist, uh, as I understand. Nope. Um, you're not suggesting that the American system um, become a communist one. No, you're not. You're not suggesting that. You're not trying to say that um, China would should control the U.S. or Canada, and that things would be better nope. if China did that, right? No. Okay. Yeah. Because sometimes people go, "Oh, so you're 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 trying to dispel falsities or rumors or conspiracy theories about China, but you're not actually an advocate of some kind of totalitarian or communist system yourself." <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Which is usually you know, yeah, that's the way the game is. Some yeah. people are very black and white thinking. You know what I mean? They just they don't they, no, they have don't. a hard time wrapping their head around that. So and and so tell me about the, just and I know it's not the subject of this latest piece, but tell me about the police the the Chinese police station story because I did hear about oh, that yeah. too that China has a network of police stations around the world. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, well, when you, when you look at like everything, you're like, okay, well, what is the evidence? Where is the evidence? Well, you know, I mean, I, you hear people repeating it in various media outlets, but where is the evidence before I, I give my conviction to something? And in this particular case, um, the evidence of the claim all originates from one organization, which is known as Safeguard Defenders. It's a think tank that was established, that's set up currently in Spain. Spain specifically is one of the few nations of Europe that you don't have to show as a nonprofit or, uh, or yeah, as a nonprofit who you're getting your funding from. So that's convenient for them. Um, it's run by this guy, Peter Dahlin, um, a British, British fellow, uh, who was expelled from China. He, he formerly had an, another outfit that operated until 2016 when he was labeled an, an enemy agent, uh, receiving foreign funding from specifically uh, CIA front groups by the Chinese government. He was kicked out of China. The organization is escaping. It was, it was I think, called China Action. Uh, yeah, that was actually it. It was called China Action, run by this British guy and some Swiss fellow. And so, yeah, they were just like yeah. using information, collecting information, um, probably managing little little networks of um operatives on the ground in China helping to form people um 
um, in in the legalese world to try to you know promote democratic rights activists um, as part of the typical model for color revolutionary activities in every country. You know, you use the veneer of human rights, pure democracy, blah blah blah. And then you you weaponize these these useful idiots to become agents, even if they don't even know it, to destabilize governments that you don't like. And you could easily label authoritarian um, in in order to sort of like rally the rules based international order community to support some overthrow of a government. So this guy was kicked out of China. He reset up shop, and he describes how all of, he gave an interview where he said everything I was doing with China Action has taken up um, the mission under Safeguard Defenders. And they produced this report, and people could read this thing called, I think it's like 110 Overseas. Um, and uh, and I read it. It was like, you know, a 38-page report. And um, like usual, when you actually read the report, and again, it's, it's funded by, you know, the <laughs> the uh, some of the funding came from the European Union, an NED front, front group, something else. No evidence. No evidence. A lot of just hearsay, you know, this anonymous person said this. Um, not actually true. The, uh, the, the only thing that they, that is true is that the, under, under the whole COVID, uh, craziness, a lot of Chinese people were stuck overseas in Canada and the U.S. and they couldn't go back home for a, an extended period. So they couldn't renew basic things like driver's licenses, uh, passport renewal, other things. Like there's all sorts of like logistical nightmares that occurred. So the different consulates, um, opened up like new, Offices are providing services for these people to come in, sometimes involving cooperating with a, a community center that would then, you know, help with a lot of the paperwork and stuff like that. That's like what they relabeled as the police stations. Um, there is that is weird. That is so that is so benign or innocuous or whatever. It's just so it's strange to call that a police station. I know it's really it's it's but it's it's literally make believe stuff. But then by re- repetition and then just citing this report, everything goes back to these the safeguard defenders grouping and their b- bullshit reports. Everyone then just ends up n- nodding their neck, not doing the rig- rigorous re- research like is usually the case with this stuff, and then that ends up just repeating it uh, as gossip that becomes fact. So yeah, there's a nine minute video. Um, which maybe I'll email it to you if you want to get that out to your the people listening today and and you know it, it's a good it's a good setup for the the episode three the big twenty seven minute video that that we're going to talk about a little bit more thoroughly today yes um and that video tack originally we wanted it to tackle the claims of China election interference into Canada which since February of this year have really been like taking up so much of the news cycle. Um, and driving, you know, conservatives, people on the left, people in the center, like all Canadians, there, there's been different messaging catered to each of the demographics in Canada, each of the, the people from all political leanings to, to sell everybody, including many liberals themselves who are supporting this narrative that the Chinese, C, you know, evil CPC has put their puppet Justin Trudeau in power, had funded, um, there's claims like they, they, the, the Chinese government funded um, 12 Liberal Party candidates in 2019 and 2021 that there, there's a slew of these claims. The problem is all of these claims originated from um, CSIS reports. CSIS is sort of the Canadian version of the CIA, mm-hmm. um, a little bit newer. It was created in 1983 um, by Pierre Elliott Trudeau, the, the first Trudeau dictator Trudeau. of Canada. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, and so they, this report is something nobody has seen. The CSIS report, nobody has seen it. It's classified. Um, the only people who have gotten the security clearance to see it, um, say that there's nothing to it, but they refuse to make it public, which would resolve this problem very quickly. You could easily see if, if it were just made public, anybody could look at it and could objectively see, does, just like I did with the safeguard defenders report, is there evidence or is it just like, shadowy, you know, anonymous claims with no evidence, but they're not doing that. They're keeping it classified. Um, David Johnston created, you know, they tried to cook up this really lame story with a a close friend of the Trudeau family named David Johnston, who is the former governor general, longtime Trudeau family friend going back to the seventies. And he was given, he was put, he was appointed to be the commissioner 
to uh, uh, read the reports and then evaluate whether it was enough evidence was available to justify a, a thorough real commission to investigate it. And he said, no, I, I read it. There's nothing there. But then it's almost like they wanted that to fail to stoke the flames of drama because nobody was going to believe what this guy says anyway. Um, so again, nobody's read it. Um, Pierre Poilievre, who's the head of the conservative party, who is the opposition party of, of the liberals, has said he's allowed to read it if he's, if he's brought into Privy Council and, you know, every, he's a member of the Privy Council, just as every member of the shadow government and active government is. Um, Canada is a weird thing that way. We have a governor general, uh, Privy Councils, all these weird things tied to London. It's part of the, the way the, the actual mechanisms of power work in Canada. But he says, you know, if I, if I went in, to the the room the and read it i i wouldn't be allowed to speak of what i read in public anymore so i'd rather speculate freely by not reading it and, and holding ignorant to right. what's in the content so again all of this stuff is just pushing uh kindling onto the drama so it made it difficult because i realized well shit there's nothing to really make a video out of it's just like claims i can't i can't dig into them so we're like okay let's just change the script entirely we had to do a few rewrites. It was a pain in the ass, but we we were like, okay, let's make it, let's let's make this about like what the hell is CSIS? Because we're all being told that this is the patriotic agency that cares so much about Canada's democracy that they uh, dropped this, that they circulated their report to trusted members of the news media, Globe and Mail, global uh, 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 global global TV, which is another right. big Canadian outfit. Ironically, both of which have received tons of money by the tr- by the by the very little liberal government that they're complaining about or exposing oh. as a Chinese operation. Uh, they received over six hundred million dollars um, in twenty twenty one by uh, Justin Trudeau. So, I mean, it's right there. Even Epoch Times, frankly, is one of the one of the news agencies that received tons of money from the liberal government of Justin Trudeau. So you know, it, it's that's just a fun little scandal there. But um, that's all so these bizarre. Agents. So I have. So let me ask. Okay, I want to. I want to like kind of engage with it a little bit. Is like. Yeah. So um, um, we have this perception that um, that in the U.S. that you know the Democrats are doing something with China and or that and also that in Canada that Trudeau is doing something with China um, and and we it's like this whole kind of. It's been repeated so many times, and so many people talk about it um, that it, it. I guess it seems true because we hear it so much. But but it, there are like, um, for example, the Biden the Biden family like has received a lot of money from China. Not from, uh, I mean, China is a big country with with you know like a, a billion and a half people, and there's lots of different interests because it's a big society. Um, but there's something like four hundred million dollars or something like this. Um, the Biden family, you know, in kickbacks or whatever. Um, or it's 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 whatever, however that is explained. Um, so is there what what's going on with that? Is that business as usual or is that is that an illusion or 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 and then separate or connected to that with the case of Trudeau, um so you're saying that the very same people that are accusing Trudeau of these things have actually been um, getting a lot of money that has been approved specifically by, by his government. Yo, that's quite the irony, isn't it? Yeah. There's something like 800 different media outlets that got to drink from this pool of cash uh, that was raised to sort of help facilitate messaging to the public under, the, under COVID health uh, emergency stuff. So that was like... In reality, I mean, it was a giant bribe to just, like, get all of the media outlets on the same page and walk in lockstep on, on the messaging. As far as, yeah, like, there's – it's it's it, it's important not to oversimplify some of this stuff um, in terms of white and black. But, like, in the case right. of Biden, you know, like, you have, I think, some major missteps from China. On the one hand, people overlook the fact that China has is engaged with their own battle against their own swamp and their own deep state. That's right. part of what – you know, Xi Jinping has been engaged with for the past 10 years with this anti-corruption program that has put something like two different former security directors of China, a former justice minister, uh, into prison for life. Uh, right. You know, people like, the reason why uh, 
Peter Dowling, who ran Safeguard Defenders, is no longer operating in China is because he was part of the, the massive purge of foreign agencies and foreign agents, many of whom had risen to great power, especially through Shanghai, which is sort of the, the British control zone that a lot of the billionaires, the highest density of billionaires is, is located around the Shanghai zone. And uh, many of the agents that sort of are, are leaning towards the World Economic Forum outlook, like uh, Jack Ma was a World Economic Forum trustee, um, are located in the Shanghai that's, click that's around the, the former. AliExpress, Alibaba guy, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, he's a super uber wealthy billionaire, kind of like a Chinese version of Bill Gates. Um, and, and China's got a very different system because it's not really, they call themselves the, the Chinese Communist Party as the name of their party. But if you look at the system as a whole, it's really, you can't call it communist by any measure. Marx would like turn it in his grave if he was, right. <laughs> if people were saying that, yeah, this is their representative of 21st century communism. Uh, um, right. but like, you know, Chad has a, just a situation where you could be an entrepreneur, you could be a businessman, you could be a billionaire. Um, but you're not allowed to make policy. And as soon as, you know, Jack Ma went, went, I think people probably are familiar with this. Uh, he went in, in a, um, he was in a very high level Chinese government affiliated meeting and he basically called for an, a complete overhaul of the Chinese financial system around a world economic forum, uh, associated type of digital banking that was tied to like a liber, a hardcore libertarian bent. Um, he basically called for like a rallying of all of the, the influencers of China to like push for this reform. And at that point he like disappeared for like eight months, you know, like he was grabbed by the collar, wow. you know, stripped of all of his, his uh, privileges and, and stuffed into his mansion and just told sit there <laughs> as, as uh, you know, Alibaba was reorganized. He, it's still a, a weird thing. And now I think he's like teaching in Japan or something. And working with some with Bill Gates actually, Jack Ma and Bill Gates or or Bill Gates's wife, former wife, have created some sort of a new organization. It's weird, but to say that this represents that Jack Ma represents China is a total fallacy and a lie. But China's been going through their own you know battle with their deep state, uh, purging of the the fifth columnists as much as they could. Uh, but it's still an issue. But on the other hand, you got people like I think Patrick Ho, who I I'd, I'd actually listened to speak in 2015. I think he was a uh, a character who was na- was China's naive on some core points, and I think especially with Patrick Ho, who was the guy who was sort of assigned. He was the former um, he was a, a high up executive in Hong Kong for a number of years before he became the head of this pro Silk Road think tank, and his job was go to African countries primarily, figure out what they need, like build relationships. Um, as sort of this back channel, you know, private sector diplomacy guy, um, pay bribes, you know, every country has their own way of doing things. So if they do bribes in Nigeria or in most of the African or, or whatever country, you just do what you got to do to get the contracts, to build the bridges, you know, and, and integrate the economic relationships of those countries with the, uh, type of paradigm of the Belt and Road Initiative of long-term economic development. And over time, the idea was, okay, even these corrupt backwards countries will learn what their true self-interest is as a country that's able to increasingly produce for itself, take care of its own needs, you know, as a, as a manufacturing nation, um, while building infrastructure. So that's the whole idea. But the, the naive, I think major big fatal blind spot with Patrick Ho and whoever the hell he was like working with on mainland China was that when, when he went to the U.S., it was like, okay, go, Go do do the Africa plan. Like what everything we've been doing that's, that's been working so pretty well, you know, drop a suitcase mm-hmm. here of, of money, find, find, figure out who makes the deals, who can facilitate, you know, contact with the business community um, in politics. Just do what you do. And, you know, he went to, okay, he's like, okay, there's this guy who's really open for business, uh, <laughs> Joe Biden. He, I got to work through his son. Right. And, uh, and, uh, Joe's brother was uh, was a big player in that, and some other members of the family. And, right. uh, and right. realized they're not dealing with the same kind of beast at all. <laughs> like they didn't realize what the hell kind of Byzantine structure of uh, of intrigue they were walking into, run by ultimately a British directed death cult that doesn't want development. They, you know, and so they uh, Patrick Ho went to jail, and a lot of the stuff went public, uh, both with the laptop and a, v- a bunch of other uh, points of of detail that that people can look into. 
So I think China really heavily misstepped. But then you see, but by by virtue of misstepping, then the you know the, the Steve Bannons out there, the Epoch Times, other things can take that and then just easily run with the narrative like, oh, it's evidence that China runs the United States. They've been taken over, you know, and everything that information is then reframed to ignore the higher context in which this is actually happening. Right. To, right. Yeah. So the sort of same thing with Times is, is, isn't Epoch Times. They, they were very, very good on COVID in the U.S. Epoch Times was very, very good on Beltway politics also and lockdowns. But when yeah. it and but when it comes to China, aren't they are they connected to the Falun Gong cult? Uh, yeah, that that's right. And they were good on culture wars too, like it right, matters right. Of, of yeah. I, I it's hard to not appreciate the content you can get from them on domestic politics and culture wars. Yes. Uh, or or anti COVID stuff, um, anti Great Reset stuff. It's generally sane, and that's what's attractive about this sort of thing. Is they, it, you know, it works because they it is, is it's attractive and it is a breath of fresh air to see a media outlet speaking so well of these particularly um, hot topics. But then as soon as they you they get your trust on this domain, all of a sudden it becomes literally making shit up on a broader geopolitical global perspective. Especially in regards to China, and and yeah, like you just said, the Falun Gong um, groupings, the the people who have been complaining that uh, the Chinese government just loves their organs so much that they keep on stealing and and, and eating their their tasty tasty pure Falun Gong <laughs> organs. It's really, right. Uh, they they are the uh, the backer of it. Um, to understand that, one has to look at um, this fellow. Well. New Tang Dynasty is the name of the umbrella organization that funds thousands, thousands of different platforms, cultural platforms. Um, Epoch Times just being one of many. Some for like into are, are into kids' education, but New Tang Dynasty was created by the Falun Gong, and and the Falun Gong itself is run by this character, strange but useful character to look into, who lives on a 400 acre estate, a compound in New York State. Um, 420 acre compound actually, uh, named Li Hongji. Mm -hmm. And Li Hongji is a really weird character. Uh, he gave an interview with Time Magazine. I think this was like one of the last times they let him speak publicly. <laughs> but because Time, and people could even go to the, go to Time Magazine's archives and read this interview. I, 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 I published it. I, well, the juiciest parts of it, at least in the, uh, the appendix of our Breaking Free of Anti China PsyOps report. He describes himself as um, a new messiah fighting an intergalactic war of interdimensional and uh, also beings that exist within our dimension as well. So different species of aliens who have been around, he says, for about 120 years, interfacing um, with the oligarchy, giving them powers. And um, and he and the, these these beings okay, are sort okay. of like so far demonic. sounds reasonable. Go on. OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And he is the uh, the the chosen one, as he as he thinks of himself, whose purpose is to bring harmony to the global Jedi force of uh, dark and light forces, and um, and he has amongst his many powers telepathy, telekinesis, the ability to heal by thought, not just only touch, mm. and um, yeah, these are things that he openly you know says that he has powers to. Um, he describes these aliens as really wanting the, the, um, that, cause w when the Times interviewer asks him, well, why, why do they want, uh, human beings? Why do they want to use us so much? And he, and he says, they love our bodies and they love our organs. They love our organs because we're made in the image of the, of, of God, the true God. Um, so he passed, he's very appealing his messaging to, to a lot of the, the Christians, the evangelical Christians mm -hmm. who just want to hear that sort of thing. And, uh, and and he describes the golden section, the golden ratio around which the human organism is constructed, which is true. I mean, Da Vinci was working on this, and, and this right. is a fact. That is a, a very divine thing that we are the most perfect material organism. That's true. But then he says, um, <laughs> but we, especially the Falun Gong, are the most divine of all. Um, and that's why the Chinese CPC, which he alludes to, um, is is in, in collusion with the aliens – to suck mm. the Falun Gong organs most specifically is the greatest of all gems of the universe. Mm. Um, 
And yeah, these people just then go out. They, they're very attractive to Westerners looking for a purpose in life as a meditation Qigong cult uh, grouping. But then when you go and it seems to be organized, like many of these or- these groups around a sort of rite of initiation. And, you know, when you're tapped on the shoulder, you can go to a higher level. And at a, at, at a certain point, you're, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't know, doing, I don't know what goes on at the higher levels, but what, you become. The difference? Hmm? What, what, what's the difference between Qigong and Falun Gong? Well, Qigong is an ancient um, Chinese meditation exercise that involves balancing your chi Kind of like it, it sort of co-evolved, I think, along with uh, yoga in India yes. um, and a recognition that we're these, you know, uh, we are these these electromagnetic beings of light, which is true. I mean, science right. can even prove that. And yes. our feelings have a psychosomatic and also physical effect upon our body. And when you bring yes. your body into certain alignment using certain if exercises, yes, this, is, this is yeah. very interesting yeah, what I, because it's it's um, when you compare for example, the, the 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 strictly almost you know I mean it's it's atheist and it's strictly materialist philosophical framework of of uh, of Chinese of, of the ideology of the Communist Party, and that you look at the things that that Falun Gong is saying. I mean, obviously they have very many cult like features: the exclusivity of the group, the exclusivity of the leader. It's them in particular that are chosen ones, et cetera. So that's very dangerous cult like stuff. But but broadly about the nature of human beings in the universe and stuff, like they tend to be kind of very. I have a more interesting thing to say than the C, than the CPC does. Yet yet the underlying geopolitics of it is very disconcerting. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, the, the, the Falun Gong got kicked out of China back in tw- uh, t- 1997 yes. um, because Li Hongji decided to uh, organize a mass movement of his followers who had developed, I mean, he sort of came out of nowhere. Um, in 1992, sort of like burst onto the scene just as the Soviet Union was collapsing as the organizer of what was originally sort of a fringe negligible cult that somehow had patronage and support both from the outside of China, as well as from forces within China that just grew and grew in influence. Um, and then, yeah, he basically had a, uh, an intervention to try to shut down Beijing and had his, his organizers or his, his devotees go to the streets and like block streets, have mass protests for days on end. And it became understood that it was a very disruptive institution and um and it was banned and he was kicked out and he was immediately given sanctuary like i said by the cia and and lived in his 400 acre compound as a billionaire kind of like he kind of reminds me a little bit on the one hand of fatula gulen um who runs yes, his own yes. weird cult in That's turkey right. and, and yes his own fifth columnist uh sort of the same thing and, and fatula gulen lives in like some giant compound in philadelphia and s- sort of the similar multi-billionaire uh, pseudo religious guru, but it has a lot of business interests and cultural interests and has a lot of devotees in the Turkish government. Even today, some of them seem not to have been totally purged in 2016. That's right. Similar thing. And I think China also, they have a, a bit of a, a better memory of even the recent past. And when I say recent, recent for us might be like what Richard Nixon working with mm-hmm. Schultz with the dollar for China, like recent past might be recent, like, like, yeah, the nineties. You're like, I'm like, Oh yeah, the sixties. Yeah. Recent. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, China's like probably their their idea of recent might be something more like you know the 1850s civil war of uh, the the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom, which this is very much reminiscent of the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom um, operation. You, you know, like in the middle during the Opium Wars, the Second Opium War, before and during, yes. they were going through their own civil war crisis, and the reason why was there was this fellow who is a disciple of a few. Jesuits, British and American uh, Jesuits and Jesuit collaborators um, who are these evangelicals uh, based in um, southern China who trained this guy and, and got him, helped groom him to the point that he believed that he was the reincarnation of Jesus Christ's brother. Uh, like a, um, like a, uh, wait, Jesus Christ's brother? Brother. Yeah, it was a weird thing, right? As if, so they like have this James whole weird Gnostic or, thing or, about like this. Yeah. I don't I, it was weird, right? So they have yeah, a whole yeah, story. Yeah, so yeah, it, pseudo, theories, yeah. it was like a pseudo Christian cult um, that was sort of a precursor in some ways to like they that basically got rid of you know private property. They created these communes, collectivization. It was a really weird thing. 
And uh, the guy had this belief that he had to bring in the new Taiping Heavenly Kingdom as a new dynasty to overthrow overthrow the Qing dynasty. And they ran a civil war for like 15 years. And um, and again, he was always he always had these weird British and American handlers um, who are part, who are members and, and very tightly knit with the opium trading families of the Boston Brahmins and the British uh, East India Company. And um, actually, a guy who was a uh, who was part of Frederick Engels' um, uh, salons, forgetting his name now. Uh, Anton Chaikin goes through him really in depth in his uh, Treason in America book back in 1984. Uh, was in charge of was the, um, the 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 sort of the viscount of uh, of the British in uh, China at that time who oversaw this operation. Forgetting his name, damn it. Anyway, um, yeah. So that. Yeah, th- this guy actually nearly won, and, and that was a big point that the British used to the, the Chinese government in the 1850s to say, look, if you don't give us everything we want, if you don't give us like Hong Kong, uh, all of these other concessions, we will recognize the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom as the only author- uh, legitimate government of China, which is the same threat they, they were doing at, around the same time during the American Civil War, right? Saying to the, <laughs> basically saying that, we are 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 prepared to recognize the Confederate South as the only legit as a legitimate government. Thus, yeah, the British were doing line. that. The yeah. British were doing that as that was why Tsar Alexander II sent the the the, the Russian uh, ships to uh, the coasts of America, New York, and California in, in yeah, 1863. Yeah, not a lot of people know. Not a lot of people know that the Russians played a role in defeating slavery in the American South. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, the great liberator Alexander II, who had liberated the serfs, twenty-five million, um, was very much cut from the same first cloth, cloth yeah, as Lincoln. So first, he abolished slavery in Russia. Yeah, and then and then in and then assisted the U.S. in abolishing slavery in the South. Yeah, yeah, and and, and as was later revealed by an interview delivered by uh, from Alexander II to Wharton Barker, who is. Uh, a banker and he had a, a publishing house, but he published a, an interview with, with Tsar Alexander II who said, you know, like the reason why I did this is that I not, not for any particular love of America, but I knew that without America, there would be um, not much to resist the United States. Uh, sorry, th- there would be not much available to resist Britain and British global intrigue as an international force, as well as um, the inability for us to work with another pro industrial uh, state that thought on the same wavelength as we did. Now that that's not his words. You got to read his his volume one of the Clash of the Two Americas that I wrote with my wife Cynthia. Um, has a chapter going through this where we cite all of these interviews, all of and we we quote at length from Alexander II describing why he sent the 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 Russian Navy as a as a message to the French and the British specifically that if they recognize the Confederate South as a legitimate government, which would bring them closer into a position where they would be able to militarily and legally support the Confederacy, even though they were doing right. it covertly, they would be able to do it overtly Openly, upon yeah. recognizing it as, a, as an authoritative, uh, an actual government, Government. Yeah. Um, then that would, that would be Cassus Belli with Russia. And that dissuaded, at the time, England and France from doing what they were threatening to do. But they, they, that same thing, the same thing that they were doing to the United States to break up the U.S. was the same thing they were doing to China at the same moment, right? Um... So all that to say, this was all done by synthetic cults masquerading as pseudo-Christian organizations that were organized by Western intelligence to disrupt China from within as part of the cultural warfare great game. Um, so Li Hongji, the intergalactic messiah uh, who created this other thing, is really reminiscent of that same model. Like I think the Chinese sort of picked up on that early on and they were like, no, we can't, we can't have this in our midst and expelled him. Um, that's also where, like, you got these different clashes with these pseudo Catholic Christian organizations under Pope Francis, who's going right. to war with the, uh, the C- like the, the Chinese government and Pope Francis do not get along. There's a huge war right now over the fact that Francis wants control over the Catholic church in, in China and China's saying, no, no way. <laughs> We're not going to let you right. do I mean, that. I mean, the Catholic church in China is effectively like, you know, I guess that would be called schismatic or something. Right. I mean, it's not yes. under the control of the Vatican. It's, exactly, it's kind of Which like is, the Anglican Church of China, or like or something like that. I mean, it's yeah, and I mean, ultimately, they you know, you 
the the Bible is the same Bible. People say, oh, it's a different Bible. No, it's it's it's, it's the Bible. It's uh it's translated into into Chinese script. Um, there's no like make believe, no adding anything new to it. Um, people can complain or have have debates about the meanings of various symbols within the context of where they arise, but um, they, there's just the they, you you don't have the liberty to just do whatever you want to do as the Catholic Church operations are concerned in China. Um, they do have oversight, you know, that they have to still abide by. Which I mean, the Jesuits, for Jesuit, before that, uh, this is so people understand that we have, within the church, within the Catholic Church, there was an understanding that a Jesuit would not be the Pope, and the present Pope is a uh, Jesuit. So this is very, very weird, first of all. And um, the Jesuits did a big thing in China. They were trying to uh, tamper. I mean, they may have succeeded, you know, Chinese history, Chinese culture. Like they've been they there was lots of fires and libraries and things that the Jesuits were involved in, in revisionism in China. Not of, not what Mao means by revisionism, but of historical revisionism. And um, it's been it's it's on the one hand. You can understand that Catholics in China would want their church to be in full communion with the Vatican. On the other hand, the, the trade-off, unfortunately, is that you open yourself up to these Jesuit agents who come in and start to try to undermine the sovereignty of your country. Or you, know, you can see, for example, the games that the Catholic Church has been playing with the Orthodox Church in Russia, for example, right? So you kind of have this thing. Also, another point for folks to connect some dots so you have Alexander just kind of backing up on the Alexander II thing. What people may also need to understand is that so the Civil War w- was happening, but just a few years before that, there had been the Crimean War, and the Russians had just had to defeat France and England and the Ottomans in Crimea. And um, and and Alexander II and Nicholas I uh, were commanders and leaders um, in that conflict against uh, the UK and France. So this is almost like, so yeah, the American civil war is happening just, you know, eight years or something after the end of the, of the Crimean war. Yeah, exactly. And that those should all be seen as this, as different parts of the same thing. Same uh, conflict. Exactly. Yeah. The world war. Yeah. Really. yeah, exactly. It really is that. Um, and like the uprisings in India that saw the, the British, really have a headache on their hands like the british had been in india now for you know it, it had only just recently been made the crown jewel um but they had an, an 1860 uprising of the indians of all walks of life hindu sikh muslim all together who fought against the british um over the course of many many months the british mm-hmm. had to allocate a lot of their resources to putting that down um at the same time as they're fighting the the, the chinese opium war that they're they're supporting the chinese civil war that they've just like put a huge amount of resources into sucking, uh, tricking Russia into falling into this, uh, this Crimean war with the French and the Ottomans. And I mean, yeah, Russia misstepped. They really wa- they should have known better than to walk into that one. Um, and then at the same time as they're funding the, the Confederate civil war and the same time that they're pushing for, uh, lo- you know, uh, Porti- uh, 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 Juarez. So you, you have the overthrow right. of, of Benito Juarez in, in Mexico who's also dealing with his own city of London directed operations inside of, and then all of like Latin America, you got a, you got a Habsburg, yeah, Napoleon, the uh, Porfirio Diaz. Yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. Oh man. And it's just, it's a global war. Like you said, it really should be war, called yeah. the first but world one war, thing that right? People, people don't always appreciate. In fact, is that the U S and Russia have been on the same side of most of these global conflicts, including both world wars in the 20th century. Yeah, and the American Revolution itself too. Like it was, yeah, yeah. you know, Russia that was leading the League of Armed Neutrality that was helping that that was largely responsible for g- ensuring the goods and supplies and weapons and munitions uh, that would make it into the hands of American fighters against the British Empire from Europe. Um, so that How was that was entirely the British Russia. Empire today. Oh, it's super strong. In in one way, it's super strong. In another way, it's super weak. Right? Because. Um, it's it's much more it's much harder for people to recognize the power structures of Britain's invisible empire. Um, they control Canada. I mean, totally control Canada, right? Yeah, the whole Five Eyes Commonwealth. And I guess this could like help us sort of vector back into sort of the the substance of the documentary, which moves, yes. like I said, from kind of election interference into like what the hell is uh, CSIS, 
Is it really this patriotic agency? What is the five eyes that CSIS is a, a part of? You know, um, so what is the five eyes? Intelligence services. Yeah, it, yeah, exactly. And, 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 and CSIS, just so people may not be aware, it's, it literally stands for Canadian Security Intelligence Services. Yeah, like you said. And then, um, it, the, it works closely with another organization called the Canadian Communications Estab- uh, Establishment. Uh, no, sorry, Canadian Communication Security Establishment. They're, they sound the same. They're two sort of different, different agencies that, that work closely together. Kind of like the NSA, which works with the FBI and uh, CIA. So, um, that's what is, what is CSIS? And, and we also address in this video, how does the Five Eyes interface with NATO? which involved going back in time a little bit to the creation, like why was NATO created? Why was the Five Eyes created? Um, as, and so that begins a, a, a starting point. The starting point we've chosen in the video was the dangerous alliance of the U.S.-Russian-China alliance of 1944-45 that had been carefully organized by patriots of all of those three nations. Well, maybe China was, it was a little bit weaker because, unfortunately, Franklin Roosevelt was duped into believing that Chiang Kai-shek could be a viable partner in, uh, you know, bringing a new system online after World War II. Uh, I think, yeah, FDR was heavily, badly, badly advised on that point. Chiang Kai-shek turns out to be a, a complete corrupt jackass. Um, couldn't, wouldn't have been a very viable partner. But anyway, you did have an idea coming out of Bretton Woods that the New Deal and the reform of the banking system that was done to great success inside of the United States and the, the large-scale mega projects that increased the productive powers of labor, the industrial output of the United States, and helped the U.S. build economic sovereignty up to the point that they would be able to become an, um, a partner with other nations like Russia who were, who were doing serious battle with the, the Nazi Wehrmacht. And um, that, that productive power was made possible by the battles against Wall Street and the city of London starting in 1933. It was an ongoing battle the whole time. It was never easy for Roosevelt. He avoided two assassination attempts, a, a military coup. Um, but he saw eye to eye with Stalin because both Roosevelt and Stalin both had to deal with active fifth columnist deep state operatives. In the case of Stalin, it was obviously the, the Trotskyist uh, freaks who are always loyal to the, the British fascist high command and, and we're, you know, trying to do business with the, the Japanese and the, the German Nazis and, and all these things as part of carving up the, the world into, uh, into jurisdictions for a new world order. And, um, and in America, it was, you know, the United States FDR had to deal with his own road scholar. Yeah, baby the, Eric Blair Blair model. Model. the Trotsky's model is the Eric Blair model that you see in, uh, in 1984. Oh yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you, yeah, except maybe, yeah. And, and the fact that so many of these, these followers, these devotees of Trotsky in America, like Sidney Hook and, uh, James Burnham and James Wolsetter, uh, and Irving Crystal, all of these guys who, who in the thirties and forties, early forties, or at least thirties were up until like m- months before Trotsky's murdered, um, are all they all go on to become the founding fathers of the neoconservative movement. They're all the ones who are trying to keep the United States out of World War II. Um, because the whole idea was that, you know, the Trotskyists are going to become ultimately victorious in Russia. They will they will they will kill the nationalists who have, you know, organized themselves around Stalin and bring themselves back into some sort of a collaborative position with the Nazis and the other fascist agencies of Britain who you know, you had a fascist king waiting to be brought back into into power, um, King Edward the uh, the Eighth, who was you know in Portugal the whole you know during World War II, saying you know I'll be your Nazi king again. You had Oswald Mosley, you had uh, Lloyd George, both were Nazi wannabe prime ministers of World War II, saying I'm ready to we're ready to come in and be the Nazi prime ministers. Right, and, uh, and the very interesting people, exactly like Mosley before going on to form the British Union of Fascists, formed the left wing of the Independent Labor Party that was pro-Trotskyist. So that's... Exactly, so, yeah. So, and he, yeah. So people don't know yeah. that Mosley went from Leninism to Trotskyism to fascism. And he was a Fabian the whole time, too. He was, in, he was openly uh, yeah, working well, yeah, with the that's, Fabian that's Society, which are like... Yeah, that's his part of his yeah. title. Right. And that's part of, like, the Fabian Society. That That's what people... See, most most Westerners today 
are have been trained to oversimplify the very complex idea of socialism into like one thing. And yeah. it's so much more complex than people realize. And what they the, the socialism that most Westerners hate and fear rightly so is the Davos, you know, Green New Deal socialism of that masquerades as as capitalism, but it's really feudal capitalism, it's feudal socialism, it's really Fabian socialism. It's run by a bunch of anti human misanthropes, which is what the Fabian society always were, um who create an attractive honey coated net for the disenfranchised and abused labor and poor to then fall into the net and then weaponize the, the poor so that they become instruments of their own uh, eugenics uh, future. And, yeah, and, dependency um, and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So they, they hate the masses that they profess to like champion. And so these elitists like Mosley, Sir Oswald, and uh, George Bernard Shaw and H.G. Wells and and, and Paul James Mac- Burnham, and Matt Shackman, uh, yeah, Matt Wells. Oh my God, yeah, these guys are terrible. And, yeah. But they all become the fact that they all become then right wing hardcore anti Soviet neocons, um, like telling. more McCarthy than McCarthy in the in, right. in the Cold War. Yeah, very telling and very much. It's not surprising when you look at it from this standpoint that they only saw Trotsky or Trotskyism. As a useful as a vehicle, as a vehicle, yeah, to achieve ultimately this sort of like uh, end of world government and a and a managerial revolution, as as James Burnham calls it, you know, his ideal society. It's a managerial society where there is no real democracy. People are just well behaved, and you get some like you know add ons to it with Aldous Huxley's concepts of soma and these things that are infused into their design. But it's it's all the same thing. Um, so. Why am oh, I saying this? I'm saying this of... we have a feedback from a reader, from a listener, oh, yeah. who's saying sure. that they have a. They're, maybe you can you can weigh in on this. They're saying the Catholics are grumbling that the Pope is not choosing the bishops in China like he does everywhere else. The Chinese state has a say in this. Actually, Francis got the ball rolling on this, and the Trad Catholics hate him for it, which is why Bannon, rabid Trad Catholic, is so anti-China with his role in Epic Times. So yeah, so Bannon does, and Bannon uh, backs the Epic Times stuff. You know, I almost thought at first that, that Bannon was behind Epic Times. And like, oh, it's the, it's this Chinese group. It was very strange. Yeah, no, that's, that's really interesting what, what your, your uh, listener is saying. And yeah, it's important. And Bannon, Bannon's role, I, I recently wrote an article for uh, The Last American Vagabond. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty happy with how it turned out, and I highly recommend people check this out. It's called Steve Bannon and China's Deep State. You can put my name in with that title and you'll get it. Um, Steve, Steve Bannon, Bannon and, and China's Deep State. Yeah, China's in bed. Like the, the actual deep state of China, the thing that's taken over the British directed the Anglo-American directed deep state operation that's been working to like subdue humanity under a global feudal empire of neo trotskyist sort of like structures, a managerial sort of great reset. Those same operatives who are built up in China to undermine China from within as a viable civilizational state are in bed with Bannon. They're the ones working with Bannon. Like Miles Guo is a character I go through in quite a lot of detail in that article. And Miles Guo was a guy who escaped getting arrested in 2015 inside of China. He was a, a, a multi-billionaire. He ran Zenith Enterprises, um, a branch of the Morgan, the JP Morgan operation in China. It was called like Morgan Beijing or something that he also ran as a real estate financier, yeah. investor, investment banker. And um, and he was actually early on, he was working with this guy uh, who later ran Apple Daily, um, whose name I'm forgetting, a big funder of the uh, the Hong Kong protest movement of 20, 2015 and 2019. Oh, um, oh, oh. That guy, right? Um, yes, who went to jail uh, in 2021. Yes, yes, yes. It was a case. Uh, I'm forgetting his name. Anyway. But yeah, he he was a big bankroll originally, this Apple Daily billionaire of uh, the Tiananmen Square Soros CIA operation that tried to bring in a new Maidan and uh, a new neo-Trotsky, Chinese Trotskyist in the form of uh, Zhao Ziyang, who you and I have spoken about in the past, yes. who is a, uh, a a tool of George Soros and the CIA. He's known as the Gorbachev of China, Zhao Ziyang, and, and he was supposed to be the guy who would, who would sweep in as the great savior of the the, the people um, and and clean up the Politburo and be brought in sort of as a as a as a Pinochet like liberalizer of the economy that would privatize everything of China in the 1990s, which is what he said he was going to do had he been successful. 
But that was Tiananmen so Square for you. Ties. Yeah, we use we use a funny language on our channel so that people kind of understand the process. It's it's in developing countries, nationalization is sovereignization. In developing countries, often um, privatization is actually the opposite of what you would think it would be because it doesn't place the control into the hands of the people where they can buy it. It places the control into foreign corporations or foreign governments or foreign Rothschild investors, whatever, right? So we, yeah, so so people understand like in, de- in the developmental model, countries have to nationalize or socialize big industry to keep it out of the hands, not necessarily of oligarchs within the country, that could be manageable perhaps, right? But to actually keep it out of the hands of foreign oligarchs that want as, as imperialists that would want, that don't even, that don't even care about you, that just want to just sort of uh, pump and dump or whatever they're going to do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, that's, that's, so that's what they intended to do with China had the Maidan been the successful color revolution. Oh, sorry, the, the Tiananmen Square had that been the successful right. color revolution that, it was in the Philippines or it was later on in the Maidan in Ukraine. Uh, that would have been the fate. It would have been a more like Russian perestroika glasnost fate of China in the 90s. But uh, the Chinese were able to rally their uh, their patriots sufficiently um, to kick out Soros back then, to put Zhao Ziyang into prison, strip him of all. This guy was the head of the, the, the Chinese Communist Party, right? It, that's right, that's right. no, no small it, it will. Was, this is inside um, the communists. This is the deep state in China. Yeah. They uh, were... Post, uh, you know, this was like, like, they, they, you know, the things that Deng did were very important, uh, Deng Xiaoping. But then moving forward, there's people who then took those openings and they yeah. went to the British Empire and said, hey, how can we help you put put me in power and, and trade you China in return? You know, yep. and then you had Hu Jintao and, and yeah, the whole, the whole, yep. yeah. Now, I have a question mm-hmm. for you. Which is effectively, um, can we consider you an, an honorary American? <laughs> I, 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 I'm a Republican, that's for sure. I mean, I, I guess I, if you want to, you're, you're, you're an American, so you have the right to, I guess, induct me, right? So we can confer that, yeah. Um, and okay. tell, and I, we're going to get back to China, but just so you will understand, um, Americans tend to think that Canada is just like another America, but it's north of us. You guys don't have a Constitution Bill of Rights. You guys are subjects of the crown, not technically anymore, or are you? Or what's uh, what's really going on? You, is it a fake country? What's up with your flag? Yeah, it's a, it's a fake country um, with, with some viable historic – like I did a deep study for a few years to try to make sense of Canada, and, and, it, and the effect of it was the Canadian Patriot magazine that I created in 20, 2012. Right, really, um, yes. Sort of – yeah, thanks. Um, the idea was to just, you know, I, I couldn't find anybody who wanted to publish the research that I was pulling together. I was very excited, you know, um, about some of the historical discoveries that were all you, very um, fitting together super well. Because I, I basically, at the time, I was working with the, the LaRouche organization. And one of the things that people might have noticed about the LaRouche organization is there's a lot of emphasis on the British Empire as a still existent phenomenon in global politics. And I was like, well... I'm I'm saying this to people, but here I am in Canada. And I, I I got involved with them in 20, 2006, and I was in, like a volunteer, you know, doing a lot of organizing. And I'm like, I'm saying this, and I get it. I, I sufficiently began to understand how this works for the United States takeover and how the U.S. has been under the control of this foreign agency since JFK was murdered. And I was like, okay, I, I can wrap my mind around that, but I still don't get Canada. We're still a monarchy. We still have a privy council, like. Are we a democracy? Like, are, are, how is this apply to Canada? And, and for the 40 years that the LaRouche organization had been active in Canada, it was like small little offices, never, never more than a couple dozen people at a time. Nobody ever really seems to have done the work of just like proving that that's true or why is that true in Canada? Like, how does, how does Canada work? What is our history? Nobody did the, nobody did the damn work. And I was like, well, if I'm going to organize in Canada, if I'm going to go to Ottawa and like, have meetings with diplomats or try to meet with members of parliament or, or even organize citizens to take responsibility for the oncoming collapse and doing something, I should probably know what is the terrain I'm operating in and that I'm expecting them to operate in, uh, rather than just saying like, Oh, go, you know, <laughs> go, go, uh, kick out Dick Cheney from Canada or something like that's, that's disempowering right. and stupid. Like, why would I say that? Um, right. So, so yeah, that research, a few people felt the frustration I felt, and we put together a lot of this, this 
uh, history and I couldn't find anybody to publish it. And I was getting annoyed because it was like, it was a great story of our, of our, it's like a new macro narrative that takes into consideration the fact that we were, we've always been a, 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 a weapon used by the British empire as, as part of the British toolkit to destabilize Russian American friendship and mm -hmm. run anti-American operations from British uh, basing operations in Canada from the Civil War, even before that, all the way to the murder of JFK. So, you know, and then also it's not just all bad because then you start appreciating when you when you start looking at this ugly fact of or this 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 sort of bitter quality of our of our history, you start seeing that oh shit, all of the 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 things I enjoy, the hydroelectric power, the abundance that I that I enjoy didn't happen because the empire gave it to us. It always happened because you had a Republican minded um, person who achieved political power in the 19th century, in the 1920s, in the 1930s, right. 50s, 60s, 70s, who fought like hell against the Malthusian British directed Rhodes scholarship operation. And there's always been Rhodes scholars and Fabians running, trying to keep us underdeveloped backwards, better, easy to manage and control. It's um, a misanthropic had... ideological cult, so people understand. It's a misanthropic eugenicist ideological cult. I know it's hard for people to kind of understand that history can operate with these things in there, but just to kind of give a sh short definition. Yeah. Of, yeah, yeah, it's kind of like a universal constant uh, of the attributes of oligarchs. Um, right. is they have what you just said. That's what that's one thing that they're religiously wired by. And will always act in a court like a cat will always be a cat. Whatever the environment is, you put the cat into, it'll act like a cat. An oligarch will always predictively act like an oligarch according to these attributes, and that's one of them. Um, they will sabotage development of of people that allow us to tap into our deeper potentials by actualizing new discoveries and the fruits and new technologies to overcome limits to growth. They will always try to sabotage that, and if they can't sabotage that. They will act like they like it to the degree that they can get close to the control of what is the science or technology that, that they say that they like, only with the intent of hollowing it out, controlling the narrative of, of science itself, and, and then undermining it from within later on, like they do with everything. If you can't destroy it, you, you get close to it, and it's the Delphic technique. You, you model yourself on it on surface, but you then destroy the substance of what makes it happen. Um, whether it's a nation, right. whether it's the church, whether it's a government, whether it's uh, whatever, that's what they do. You lead the thing that you want to destroy. Exactly, exactly. Uh, so that's what they did to the United States by making everyone believe that the U.S. is just this one-dimensional empire built on hypocrisy and slavery and corruption, and it's never been anything good. Um, and they forget, and people forget the, the 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 beautiful origins of the of the U.S. And they did the same thing with science itself. And they said, "Oh yeah, see, science is just, you know, this thing we define it as as this descriptive mathematical thing that Bertrand Russell, the positivist, says it is." <laughs> why? That's the okay. thing. About why I'm not a Christian? And, that guy. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, and you that know, book, people people will know that book. And what's very interesting about Bertrand Russell's Why I'm Not a Christian, as an aside, to piggyback on what you're saying here, is that if you read it, you will encounter all of the same arguments that, you know, if you were like a precocious middle school student when you were like 12, 13, or 14, like all of the atheist arguments that a person that's never talked to a religious person comes up with are the things that Bertrand Russell says. So if you... If you're like, if you were an eighth or ninth grade atheist, like I was, like I, I knew Bertrand Russell's arguments because those were just logical arguments to me. I, I wouldn't read um, that book until it was like required reading in university 10 years later, you know? And I was like, oh, I remember all these, you know, because they're the most like, if can, if God can do anything, can he make a rock that he can't pick up? And that's supposed to be proof that God doesn't exist. Those are Bertrand Russell's arguments. They're totally low brow. It's very strange considering how exalted he is as some kind of brilliant philosopher. And don't get me started with Karl Popper and his extreme naive empiricism and ultra positivism. <laughs> this is why I love I love talking to you, Joaquin. You're you're able to bring a new dimension to these discussions that I'm not used to uh, having as, as an interlocutor. That's cool. Uh, yeah, that's right. And you know, one thing also of interest. Like yeah, well, one piggybacking on what you just said, uh, nothing what Bert, of what Bertrand Russell is bringing to the table is really all that new. A lot of the peripatetics and a lot of the the, the uh, philosophers 
uh, the scholastics were also talking about the, these sorts of like, uh, logical absurdities, um, back in the medieval era, era even, you know, like this is not, these are not new things, but right. he popularized it and he was a high level grant. Like, I mean, the guy was a Cambridge apostle, uh, leader of the Cambridge apostles, you know, he was an early, um, well, what, one of the, uh, one thing that came up in, in my wife's research on James Burnham was when Burnham breaks from Trotsky, he writes a letter to comrade Trotsky saying, um, why he no longer believes in Trotsky's dialectic materialists, uh, di- dialectic materialism. And he mm-hmm. says, I've learned comrade Trotsky. If you'd like me to give you a reading list, I'll give you one. Uh, but I have learned from Bertrand Russell's Principia Mathematica that your dialectic materialism is an obsolete fraud. And I am now, and he, he basically describes his, his devotion to Bertrand Russell and, and specifically Russell's Principia. And people are, that might, might, that might confuse or, or fall under the radar of a lot of people who might not realize the importance of what he just said because. Yes, myself Russell, included. Please continue. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I can do that. <laughs> um, what Russell is doing is more than an academic mathematical exercise because the Principia he, he co-writes with, with Alfred North Whitehead, a, another Cambridge disciple, uh, apostle, by the way. We, these Cambridge apostles are very high level. So is yeah, John, wait, John back Mac- up and Mar- explain so people can kind of take a mental note. So, cause sometimes this, these are, these are, these are proper nouns. Okay. Yeah. A Cambridge apostle is what? Uh, every year in Cambridge, I don't know when this began centuries and centuries ago. There, as part of the grooming process of creating the next generation of managers of empire, um, there, there was an institution created kind of like a high level, a much higher level version of the skull and bones called yeah. the Cambridge Apostles. It's a grouping of 12 students, 12 positions at every, every year are, uh, are available to those who will be selected from amongst the children of oligarchical families. Generally, very rarely is it somebody who comes from outside of one of the families unless they exhibit an immense amount of talent. So it's like um, a dean's will, list for rich kids or? Yeah, kind of, who are then, like, groomed into the higher mysteries of, like, mass uh, epistemological warfare, shaping the zeitgeist, what are the techniques of of mind control, epistemological... So it has aspects like the like Rhodes Scholar, then, too. Rhodes Scholars are, like, lower-level doers, you know? Like, as they right, say, right. the like Oxford, Oxford and, and London schools. School of Economics are where they, they, they groom and create the doers of empire, mm-hmm. um, whereas Cambridge is where they create and groom the thinkers of the empire, mm-hmm. the... Mm-hmm the creative planners, right? Um, that so explains that's a lot where, just right there because it's it's clearly dry of ideas. Yeah, it's a war of ideas. It's a battle of the mind and it's the war of ideas. Um, so very few people, even amongst the higher echelons of, of the oligarchical management are, I think, aware in full of what their what the role is that they're playing in a, in a broader grand strategy, right? They're all given narratives that fit their status or their, their the role that they're expected to play as tools. Some might might have a very grandiose role, you know, like Li Hongji believes that he is the the Messiah. Obama yeah. probably had, I think Obama had a Messiah complex. As such, they made sure. good cult leader. Um, Jim Jones, lower level, the same thing. Um, but <clears throat> everybody has a sort of narrative, and you have narratives that are higher for the elites, and and elites amongst the elites have their own narrative. But very few, I think, are very self aware of the actual game. And I think from my analysis. Cambridge members of the Cambridge Apostles are among the few of the few of the few of the few who are very self-aware of the game that they're playing. And you can see that by like, what was Bertrand Russell's first assignment um, after becoming a teacher at Cambridge? Um, like at, after leaving university, he the first book he publishes is the authoritative book on Leibniz and how Leibniz's mind works and how Leibniz uh, discovered what he did. Now, the, the book itself, I've read it. It's a bunch of garbage because I've also read Leibniz. I've actually read Leibniz. That was one of the good things that – one of the things I'm grateful for in my association with the the LaRouche organization for, for many years was it gave me an opportunity to sit down over years and years. Like we'd go full days throughout the week reading original writings of people who made discoveries. And and it's a really good exercise to try to rep, re, replicate what was Leibniz investigating, how was his mind working when he was like wrestling with paradoxes of nature and generating creative solution concepts that generated the infinitesimal calculus. Or even, you know, he's the, so many, I mean, he was a really universal thinker. Um, or Kepler, how did he discover what he discovered as far as the coherence of the planets around the sun, you know, like who is, but what anyway. You're, we're talking about is how, how, how Bertrand Russell 
um, yeah. misinterprets or, or misrepresents uh, uh, Leibniz. Leibniz. Yeah, and he basically says Leibniz, you know, he, he creates this concoction, this, like, uh, Gnostic sort of uh, interpretation of, like, Leibniz's bio saying, you know, he had two truths, one for the one for the surface appearance and one for his inner truth where he did everything for personal hedonism, but he he acted like he was a virtuous lover of humanity, but that was only to get money from the kings who were naive. And he, like, just this garbage shit. They do the same thing with... Uh, that's what the Straussians do for Plato, for example. They say, oh, yeah, Pl- uh, Plato or Socrates right. had two, two uh, discourses, one for the masses, one for the elite. And in, in truth, the true, the true Plato is actually Thrasymachos uh, from book one of the, the Republic who just says the greatest good is the, is the greatest hedonism and the greatest evil is, is only physical pain. Um, he's like that. That's really who who Socrates, aka Plato, is. Um, no, it's, right, it's, right, it's, right. It's, 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 they totally twist it. Real. They they flip around the yeah. characters, and it, it yeah. Yeah, they do the same thing for everybody. So they do that. That's what Bertrand Russell does for Leibniz. He does it then for Riemann. Uh, he writes a book, uh, redefining Riemann and uh, like what Riemann was as a mathematician, basically taking away all the physical science that Riemann actually discovered, and just saying no, he was just playing with mathematical numbers, games, and probability theory. Nothing, nothing based upon discovering the laws of, of the boundary conditions shaping physical space time, which is actually what Riemann was doing as a follower of Leibniz, um, who believed devoutly in God and God's creation as something which we are, uh, uh, mandated to, uh, tune ourselves to if we're true lovers of truth and humanity. Um, that's, that's like Leibniz and Riemann for you. These guys are like the highest quality of, of loving souls, but Bertrand Russell is extracting that, right? And so these are like the first two books that this guy is writing. And then with the Principia Mathematica, which again, Burnham says is what convinced him that Trotsky was, was outdated. It's basically taking the worst elements of dialectic materialism, which, which, which is basically, I think from my view, the Achilles heel, the worst thing in the, in Dimat is the idea that quantity always shapes qualities. Um, which Trotsky is trying to, cause Trotsky is, you know, in the, in the twenties when he's overseeing the new economy policy, basically like perestroika of the nineties in Russia was done already in the twenties under Trotsky <laughs> to liberalize and like, you know, privatize Russia on, on behalf of Armand Hammer and, and other Western bankers. Um, he's also in control of from 24 to 25. Trotsky's in control of the Russian science and industrial policy, and he gives a speech saying, you know, like, uh, we have, that we, we have to, to be acceptable scientists, we all have to accept that quantity always shapes qualities. And he, it's this disgusting speech saying that Mendeleev didn't even know that he was a follower of Dimet, but he really was. And anyway, so it's, it's a whole convoluted thing. Right, right. Um, no, just to give people some background on what you're saying, so, so we're keeping up here, is that, yeah. um, dialectical materialism, um, is the, is the, is the idea actually come up with by a guy named Dietzkin, but it was, but they acknowledge that, but then Marx and Engels basically develop it from Dietzkin. And, um, and the main idea, um, is that within a thing, within a process, um, it's kind of taking the ideas of Hegel and turning it on its head. And it's saying that within, within the world, anything, as um, quantitative changes are occurring to it, that quantitative changes um, inevitably um, create a qualitative change. Now, there are many instances where you can find that operating, but to universalize that as as the fundamental principle is a grave error because there are things which can grow and grow and grow and don't change in quality. So they yeah. focus on examples of the things which do change, that do change qualitatively as a result of quantitative change. And then they use those examples to the exclusion of others to lead it to a false argument. Anyway, just to give people that, uh, you know, to understand yeah, that, that's what you're useful, saying. That's a useful little summary, yeah. Um, and, and so to tie this back now to um, – so that's what that's what Trotsky's trying to like impose. That's that's what all of his followers are trying to like sort of infuse into their own approach to infiltrating their respective governments, especially in the United States. Um, now, okay, so Burnham says I'm I'm getting rid of Trotsky to follow Bertrand Russell's Principia. So in Principia, what's Bertrand Russell doing? He's it's a three volume work that attempts to universalize 
linear mathematical logic with the idea that you could reduce every property of the of creation in space and in time to a limited set of axioms and postulates limited like a, a finite quantity of assumptions core fundamental well, like assumptions a, like a cartesian kind of like a cartesian graph yeah um but but yeah cartesian system that has certain assumptions about like a linear uh, XYZ linear. grid that shapes the entire universe yes. in which everything exists, yes. right? On that's a timeline right, yeah. that is linear, uh, before which there was nothing, after which there will that's be nothing, right? So, yeah. Probably, yeah. Um, and so that's, so the, the, the Bertrand Russell system is like, okay, let's, let's put symbolic symbols onto ev- everything that physically qualitatively exists can be expressed in a symbol that itself can be understood through mathematical linear logic. And reducible to a finite number of axioms, which is a challenge that was put forth a few years earlier by this guy, David Hilbert, at a mathema- international mathematics conference in like 1900. So Bertrand Russell's like, okay, I did it. And it, he did the three volumes with, with Whitehead um, saying, okay, now we have just proven with this guidebook that everything in all systems can be mathematized, symbolized, reduced to limited axioms. And with that, if we could just get all of the data into our models, it's kind of like a proto-computer you could then linearly extrapolate into the future and into the past everything that will ever happen and everything that has ever happened if you just have the empirical data. It's kind of like a, a radical positiv- positivism that you have just yeah, universalized. It's, uh, Laplace's, it's Laplace's daemon. Laplace, Laplace's Laplace's da- daemon. daemon. Yeah, yeah. 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 Laplace's daemon, exactly. It's the same thing. So, yeah, he basically takes just a more sophisticated version of Lapla- Laplace's daemon. Um, um, and, and so... <clears throat> The problem here is that um, Kurt Gödel, a friend of Einstein, um, discovers an Achilles heel to that. Basically, whenever you introduce a self-referent, a self-referential in any system, it, it basically, it, in, 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 in short, um, Kurt Gödel proves in a very coherent way in his incompleteness theorem that all systems demand something outside of the system that cannot be contained within the system, both in mathematics, but also in, in ontological reality. Kurt Gödel is, by this the way, a follower, of, a true follower set, of this Leibniz. Gets set, um, this gets into set math, 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 mathematics and sets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Bertrand Russell has a very flat definition of the sets that he's trying to put the universe, box the universe into, whereas people like Riemann or Contour, at least the early Contour, or later on Max Planck and, and Gödel, are looking at the physical boundary conditions of reality shaping what can low on a lower order be described descriptively mathematically sort of the way one would imagine shadows describing the the cause that projects onto the shadows um so math is yeah, like you can use tool. inductive reasoning from the lower order manifestation to then de- to then induce from there the higher order reasoning behind it or or overarching it yeah, kind of. Yeah. But, and you have to have a flexible mind because it, it, when dealing with what Leibniz calls like, because Leibniz in his dynamics, in his specimen dynamicum, um, and also Max Planck and his uh, principles of philosophy both deal with this in their own language, uh, that there's there's two different states of reality. There's the higher reality of being that Plato discuss, discusses, and then there's the lower reality of becoming, of change, of flux. And the true scientist can't just do one or the other, but rather flexibly acknowledge both, uh, but mm. but have them in their proper place. So like Leibniz calls one mechanical causation, the other one final causation. So, right. you know, like... There's like linguistic the day, distinctions, but at the end of the day... Yeah, sorry. Yeah, but yeah, it, it's different. It's different ontological... Um, uh, rules or there the, the are two different ontologies that coexist, but one is is in a state where you like, for example, if if somebody is driving a car and hits a woman, and an investigator is like, well, why did that happen? Well, they wouldn't. It's useful to look at the weight of the car, the trajectory of the car, the speed, the velocity, the weight of the woman to see like, well, the mechanics are useful, and you could sort of obviously do that ad infinitum, right? There's always more data. That you could glean from the, yeah, you know, <laughs> the density yeah, of the rubber and tires. Yeah, 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 and and so you don't want to ignore that stuff, but you don't want to put, overvalue its role in causing the process. So the how, but that's not the why how. the that's not why the car hit the ride. That's the how instead of the why. 
or the why. Yeah, of and the then the why might right? be like a true investigator is looking at well the fact that oh shit that that guy driving it is the boyfriend of the woman who got hit and he was like you know discovered right it was on with purpose. Brother, yeah. like, that <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Oh, he wanted to do it. That's why. <laughs> it's like yeah, well, exactly. the, 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 the velocity of the car multiplied by the weight of the right. Is that okay? So um, I think we swallowed the lead though. Is that there's actually and I don't want to use the word conspiracy, but what the the I think for folks to kind of grasp because we can communicate at, at like this, um, but what we're what you are explaining actually is a perversion or or derailing that happened in the sciences even going back to the 16 and 1700s. This fight goes actually going back for several thousand years, but this is actually where the actual development of science shows very clearly that this is an ordered universe, that this is a structured universe, and a created universe created by a benevolent creator. Whereas there's the attempts and what the dominant paradigm in, is, is being controlled by is this anti-science parading as science that is, is intentionally um, hiding the data or, or, dis, or uh, I should say, um, not so much the data, uh, the arguments, the philosophy, the, the, the ontological aspect of it. So not, not necessarily the epistemic framework, but the entire ontology of this is actually meant to divert, distract, disguise the actual nature of the physical domain that we exist in. Yeah, totally. Exactly. And, and the overemphasis of the lower order into, like, cause the question is who leads and who follows in the dance, right? Of math and physics or of quantity and quality. And the oligarchical sort of technique that I guess they, they, not I guess, they, they definitely under, are, are led to understand this quite well in places like if you're a, a member of the Cambridge Apostles, you know, or a, a high level member of, of Thomas Huxley's X Club or something, you know, you, you're, the, the idea is you can always create a, um, a sleight of hand by, by putting mathematics and the quantity the quantitative considerations of, of the universe that derive from simply mathematics, mathematics being just sort of a, a one dimensional, you know, more and less, you know, uh, idea onto a, a universe that has, um, actually many more higher qualities that can't be understood through simply that lens. But you can always do people then that way by, by mathematizing things. And, you know, obviously in the newer age, especially with the quantum world opening up, there was sort of the idea that, um, we could only know things if positivism and determinism broke down from classical classical empir- empiricist mathematics. Then we could only know things via probability theory, like where the, the science of maybes, right? The rolling of the, the dice science, which was then applied to uh, Darwinian mutations or uh, the, the behavior of where the, the electron was going to be, which you couldn't know because as soon as you look at an electron, you change its velocity or its position. So, you know, there's this whole idea that all we could know is, is, is that like, like Schrodinger's cat or what? Yeah, that Schrodinger sort of believe he became a devotee of Bertrand Russell by the 40s mm-hmm. um, and stopped believing in ontological truth. Um, right. And just, yes, that was, that was Schrodinger's sort of trick. Because Schrodinger was earlier on a much more potent, more Leibnizian mind who believed yes. in ontological truths and then he, he lost it. Whereas Girdle didn't lose it. Now, here's the interesting thing that gets us back to Girdle because Girdle proves. The whole principia is, is based on a fallacious foundation. Alfred North Whitehead is more sophisticated and maybe a little bit more honest than Russell and says, you're right, we made a mistake. And, uh, you know, he, he adapts to the new obvious reality that Girdle brings to the surface. Bertrand Russell never forgives Girdle, ever, and <laughs> never never acknowledges that he actually was in, ontologically in error. Um, Girdle later on dies in 1975 or four of starvation because he's convinced that Bertrand Russell is running an international Freemasonic plot to destroy Leibniz, cover up science and kill him through poisoning. And his wife, unfortunately, who he's the only one, he only trusts his wife to take care of his meals. And she, she gets sick one, one week goes to the hospital and, and he has been driven kind of loopy at this point and mm-hmm. dies of starvation. Mm-hmm. Sad. But is he is he wrong to think that Bertrand Russell is doing all these things? No, I, I think he, he no. was probably not something. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. Now, no, I mean, um, it's when you're when you're under attack, you can become paranoid, and you, and these attacks can actually drive you or push you past the edge. But but you actually are being gang stalked. You actually are being attacked. You actually are being followed. You actually are being derailed. So yeah, this is this is a known yeah. process. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. 
Now here's here's a fun punchline that that ties a lot of this stuff together it, around the neo the Trotskyists who become neocons and why Burnham becomes a follower of 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 Russell and the Principia. Okay, so it comes around cybernetics. So one of one of Russell's disciples at Cambridge in 1913, when he's finalizing Volume Three of the Principia, is a young guy named Norbert Wiener, who is bring is brought into the uh, Russell as a small grouping of young boys who just worship Russell, who follow him follow him around. They probably give him fellatio and stuff. Um, <laughs> as as all of these philosophy, you know, these William Yandel Elliot groupings, yeah, Lord Milner's kindergarten, they all do this, right? It's, it's well, actually, this is one of the this is one of the things. Not not to stop you there, but so people understand those kinds of these though that type of hedonism and those types of things actually are one of the uh, glues that hold these groups together at a social level. Yeah, it's like the Theban Spartan male, you know, warrior, you know, groupings who are all like humping each other at night and fighting at day and stuff. It's it's weird. Um but <laughs> so the um this guy Norbert Wiener is like this pro- mathematical prodigy kid brought into Cambridge, becomes a, a, a Russell boy, and then takes it upon himself to manifest a practical science around the guideline of Bertrand Russell's Principia Mathematica, which, so Russell creates the broad framework, but then challenges his, his, his disciples to now make this a practical science of control that we can use to manage the empire. Well, um, and, and, be, and let me just say, uh, so I can help you, uh, I want to get the, I want, I'm trying to extract something from you. Um, like the, the, the facts of that are very important, don't get me wrong, but could you focus on the, the error in the ontology itself? Or can you, can you, because we, because we know that, we know that these people exist and, and different people wrote different things in different years. But in terms of the universe of ideas um, in the yeah. abstract, but with reference to theirs, though, what is the what is the how, how would you summarize, if you would, mm-hmm. like the ontological error? OK, I, w- I would do it through the practical example of what Trotsky lies about regarding because Trotsky is doing something similar to what Bertrand Russell is doing through his through his scientific uh, his attempt to impose this cage onto science, Russian science, uh, specifically with the figure of Mendeleev. Now, um, people can read Mendeleev's Principles of Chemistry, and, and you can get it on archive.org. And I, I suggest reading the first 40 pages or so, just to get in the, the spirit of Mendeleev's self-description of his method. Um, he's a platonic thinker of a very high order. He's, he's extremely Christian, um, and he's a scientist, uh, as is these are not incompatible things. Now... Trotsky would say, or Russell would also say, that the periodic table of, of elements is a great example of why mathematical considerations shape qualities. By simply adding electrons around the orbits of atoms, of, of, of nucleuses, the, you get heavier and, and qualitatively different identities of elements on the periodic of Mendeleev's table. It's an example of a, it's an example of, and they use that to demonstrate the, 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 the table of elements, the periodic table, that it, that an increase in quantity, quantity. changes the quality. Okay. Just to, yeah. just to now referencing back. Here's the paradox. Said, here's the juicy paradox. When Mendeleev discovered this in like 1867, when he came upon his discovery of the harmonic order, ordering of the period of what we call in the West periodic table, but in reality, Mendeleev's table, he, he didn't know that electrons existed. We, it took still many years, something like 35 more years before people actually had an idea of the electron per se, but he discovered it anyway without the thing, this, uh, knowledge. So what was he doing? Well, you know, like, we could read Mendeleev and his own writings to see how he describes what he was doing because he doesn't lie to us. He tells us, and he's he's looking for the musical, the musicality shaping space time that would have some harmony and symmetry, and he um, he does it. And he's looking at the crystal the crystallization of different elements. He's looking at how they combine with each other. He's looking he's he's intersectional in his thinking. He doesn't isolate himself to one narrow um, uh, a myopic you know, specialization. He's, he's, he's a right. poet himself, right? He's an economist. He's actually mad. He's studying in the, he goes to the United States to lead the, 
the Russian delegation in 1876. He goes to Philadelphia to study the American system of political economy, leading the Russian delegation, and he comes back and is assigned by Alexander II to chair the Committee for the Protective Tariff of Russia against British free trade. And he polemicizes eloquently. I got, I got, you know, his, 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 one of his speeches in, a, in the appendix of volume one of my, my Clash of the Two Americas. He polemicizes against British free trade. And in defense, not just of, of protectionism, of following the Lincoln model, but also he maps out. He's like, we can better grow our industrial sovereignty. But he calls for the mapping out both of the mining resources using his understanding of the the, the periodic uh, table, like how this helps us now understand and how to map out our, our, he our mining. He's a polymath. And also the industrial and, and educational reforms he's putting forth. And he's working very closely with uh, Sergei Vita who spearheads the growth of the Trans-Siberian Railway in the 1890s. Both of these guys are working together in tandem, hardcore-like, I mean, the whole time. Um, so Mendeleev, he's, 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 he's a, a, a lover of truth, and he's looking for the, the, um, the, the confirmation that God the Creator created the universe in a way which is both discoverable to, to uh, his children, uh, human beings, but also that is made in harmony with the quality of mind of a creative person who's able to flexibly not simply be limited to deductive or inductive reasoning alone, which are two very useful techniques or, or mechanisms of the mind to use as tools, but either one or some combination of both will not give us a solution concept to a real uh, discovery like what Mendeleev or Kepler or Leibniz brought to the table. It requires something additional on top of that, this creative uh, leap, which is inexpressible in a mathematical way, but it is absolutely ont- ontologically knowable and even necessary that it exists. But it, but it only exists if we, if we you know, have certain um, attributes that we cultivate in terms of, you know, like humility, the ability to self-reflect and to not be arrogant, to self-reflect on what our mind is doing, our false assumptions, to let go of you know, <laughs> explanatory models we were very close to, maybe emotionally, but then right, right. to discover that there's a paradox that can't be resolved with my 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 explanatory model, that requires yeah, a lot of courage that, like, and humility to say, I'm going to sit down my yeah. model huh? to resolve my paradox. Sorry, yeah, go on. Well, I was saying, like, in terms of those kind of narratives that people become develop emotional investments in, in terms of, like, descriptions or, or explanations that are catch-alls for everything wrong in the world or whatever. And I mentioned, for example, well, there's anti-Semitism, there's Catholophobia, there's, you know, whatever. There's all kinds of different – where people try to essentialize a particular religion or a, pe- or a particular people group or a particular thing as the underlying problem. You're actually – we're actually looking at things through the lens of – um, of, of ontology and the epistemic framework and how there's actually been, uh, people don't really understand that, that this is an imperial model from that. This is a, a method of control that's been perfected over centuries, uh, the British primarily. And a, a lot of these other matrices, a lot of these other control systems, um, people can go down like these false corridors or these dark alleys or whatever, and they can wind up supporting all kinds of crazy things, you know, kill them all, whatever, right? So <laughs> it's, it's, and, and those things are not accidental because they're trying to kind of produce all these different data points and ideas. And a lot of them, just like at the beginning of the show, how you were talking about how, um, how Trudeau had actually been, uh, the Trudeau government had been um, uh, given a lot of money to these media groups that actually paint Trudeau as a Chinese puppet, that these kinds of intelligence things, are, it can be hard for people to understand on the face of it why they would do that, right? But when you kind of understand the the mysticism in the, in the negative sense, or rather the obscuritism, and because there's so many potential activists, there's so many potential people that want to see change in the world, and they have a basically good idea about what's wrong and, and at the practical level. And then when they want to kind of get deeper, there's all of these kind of like dark roads and boogeymen. And then, you know, blame this person, blame this group, blame that, whatever. And we can actually deconstruct this to a battle of ideas. And there's not a, you don't have, there's not a particular person or a particular people that are at fault here. That these are, these are battles of ideas. And then the elites, wherever they are globally, 
are are invested in these and and uh, as a matter of historical fact it's been the british in our you know reality in our timeline or whatever it's been the british in this reality that have been behind so much of this well said yeah and i mean it's it's the the british is sort of like the british empire is sort of like a useful uh label to sort of get us closer to it but it's really not that either right at the end of the day because like look we were just talking about um you know Steve Bannon. Well, Steve Bannon is also a character who is the front man, um, who was brought into something called the Dignita Humanae Institute, which is run out of this old 800 year old monastery in uh, Trieste in Italy, um, which is d- designed to sort of unite the different Catholic right around, around something that was put was was promoted by Otto von Habsburg, the heir to the Habsburg Empire, who ran mm-hmm. this thing up until his death, and before that ran the Pan Europa movement, which itself was founded by another agent of the Habsburg Empire, uh Kudenhova Kaler- Richard Kudenhova Kalergi, who created this thing uh to bring about a sort of gateway to a one world government and a eugenics religion pseudo religion for the elite to manage the the diminishing human herd. Um, but so the, the Habsburg Empire on one hand structurally was diminished heavily after World War One, but on another hand, the actual inner families and, and upper level managers of the Habsburg Empire never disappeared. They're still very active power, stru- uh, uh, in the, in the, in the, in the power, uh, game itself. And, um, <clears throat> they sort of play together with their, House of Saxe-Kibbe-Goethe counterparts. You know, these oligarchs are sort of like in it together. All of the old families, some of them go back to, like in the case of the Orsini family, right? You, people can yeah, even this. The the Renaissance, Renaissance, and, yeah. Oh, it goes back to the Roman Emperor uh, uh, Julian Claus- Claudius, um, right? Like, and, and there's several black nobility families of, of Italy that can directly trace their lineage back to several doges, three uh, popes, and, and, and a couple Roman emperors. So, um, you're dealing with something which is, it, again, it looks like a cat, you know, it'll behave like a cat. If it, it'll have, it'll be, a cat is shaped by the essence of catness. An oligarch is shaped by the ep- essence of oligarchness, um, right. from the platonic sort of language w- one might want to use, right? That there's this intrinsic being, um, that shapes the behavior kind of like a blueprint of the, that which is expressed in the material domain. Now with human beings, an oligarch can change. I've seen examples of oligarchs who broke profile. You know, because we have free will, ultimately. And they're just highly, they're not given many chances. Culturally, they're born into very solid, rigid cultural matrices that have techniques almost to a science of grooming and corrupting the human heart and mind together in order to create an, somebody who will be a witting agent to advance this parasitical system into the, into the future, right? They think transgenerationally, obviously. They think in yeah. legacy terms, which, right in some ways gives them more morality than, than your average, you know, plebe who's like walking around thinking about their day-to-day existence and, and, and not thinking about their kids' lives in a weird way. Well, it gives them more <laughs> but, structure. It gives them more structure and order, which are necessary for morality, but they're not more moral. I mean, yeah, they, they have, have none, of the, none of the love. Morality. Yeah. yeah. Well, they're missing where, love. Where there, should mean, be, there should be love, <laughs> agopic love. There's actually hate. <laughs> so right, filling right, that space, right? right? <laughs> yeah. Well, and then well, the whole evil machine is works fairly well organized. It's a, it's a full-time job to be evil. It's a lot of work to be evil. It really is, which is what gives me heart to see, like, the mediocrity and laziness of a lot of, the, like, the, 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 the current, like, generation of, of so-called grand strategists today trying to like manage this thing they were bequeathed by by their their much more rigorous you know forefathers of evil um there there's a, such a mediocrity and laziness that again it gives me hope that that they're gonna continuously uh slip up over themselves and self cannibalize but okay wait but but here's the big thing this is the, the, the punchline the punchline yeah yeah that I, was, I was sort of slowly building upon um yeah i'm like pulling this so, man okay <laughs> no, but so uh, cybernetics. So cybernetic. Norbert Wiener creates in World War II the disciple of Bertrand Russell. Uh, the, he fulfills the master's desires and creates now a science of controls, command and control, that he dubs then cybernetics. Cybernetics goes on to become uh, promoted out of world, and basically it's a it's a science of that he he develops looking originally at the problem of feedback loops and needing to figure out where the velocity and position of uh, missiles are going to be 
uh, if you're in a war and you're, you need to like get the this information yeah, back down to yeah. the, the gunner, right, ballistically, and then sure. then program where the missile will be in the future based yeah, on that calculus. knowledge. It requires yeah, like it's calculus, right? Increased mm-hmm. closed feedback loops that can get that information to a command center that can then do something with it. Um, but oh, then that's semiotics. That is, yeah, yeah. Well, that's well, that's very much like computer programming, or or yeah, and that's yeah. fine for what it is, right? It has a place. It has a place in things, but. But uh, what they then try to do is, coming out of World War II, you have um, what's called the, the Macy Conferences on Cybernetics. The Macy Conferences are run by this – well, I won't, I won't say who runs it. But the Macy, the Macy Foundation, the Josiah Macy Foundation, was originally created to fund eugenics and the science uh, – the pseudoscience of eugenics in the 1930s. They funded Ernst Rudin, the Nazi doctors. That was, and they worked very closely with the Rockefeller Foundation, both doing pretty much the same thing. Um, now afterwards, when eugenics becomes a little bit more sticky after World War II to continue funding in the same old way, not like they stopped, but they had to sort of change their technique a lot. Um, the Macy Foundation starts putting all of its resources into the cybernetics conferences that bring in people like Gregory Bateson, Margaret Mead, uh, Kurt Nguyen from the Frankfurt School. A lot of the, the leading Frankfurt School social engineers are involved in this. Gregory Bateson and Margaret Mead, both of whom are in charge of different departments of what becomes MK Ultra, right? Um, that w- and and people like uh, you know, for people who want to listen to Timothy Leary's uh, work on cybernetics or his speeches on cybernetics, they can just Google that. Or Gregory Bateson's work on cybernetics, they they all see that this is like the master key that that will allow for the ultimate self, like the ultimate thing that Aldous Huxley calls for with the ultimate final revolution. Uh, or the the guideline he puts forth in the Brave New World uh, is, is essentially there. They, they see it with cybernetics. That's that's ru- that's what Russell wanted, is where you can create a, a sci- and basically this means the science of governance. Where Norbert Wiener uses the example in his um, Human Use of Human Beings and Cybernetics, these two books that were both banned by Stalin, by the way. Stalin bans these books as bourgeoisie corrupting sciences. Um, that are not allowed to be published until the day Stalin dies, and then yeah, they're he has they're a point with it. Yeah, he does. <laughs> and 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 so what Norbert is using as a metaphor is like he's like, look, it's like the in a, in a boat, a complex boat, you have a helmsman, and you have many people who have to do their specialized thing on the boat, but nobody except the helmsman needs to know what the boat is doing or knows how to like map out the reading of stars and astro navigation. Um, everybody else just needs to know their little thing. So Oompa Loompas, right? Behind the scenes. Right. That's all. Compartmentalization. Yeah. Yeah. So that's all it really is. It's, it's, it's the way to justify radicalizing the compartmentalization of systems, which begins with NATO is immediately brought online in 1945 and very quickly is reorganized to, um, follow cybernetic standards of controls with hyper bureaucratized departments that are not allowed to know what their neighboring departments are fully doing. And it's only a small managerial class who are in the nerve center as helmsmen who are allowed to see what the whole system is doing. Um, the OECD under this guy, Alexander King, who's formerly the science directorate of the British empire, Sir Alexander King is then brought in to overhaul the OECD under cybernetics management as well, starting in 1951. And uh, and he does it. This is a guy who later on goes on to work with Pierre Elliott Trudeau and the whole nest of Fabians in Canada who then create the Club of Rome, right? So he works with Aurelio Pache in 68 uh, to create the Club of Rome that's brought into the World Economic Forum very quickly uh, to justify the idea that we could treat all systems of human economies or nature as computer binary mathematical systems and thus be controlled by a small programming class um, in an executive grouping. Um, so that's Alexander King. So OECD, NATO, the former Trotskyist, uh, Albert Wolstetter, Wolstetter, who becomes a leading, uh, controller of the Rand Corporation, brings in cybernetics as the core Bible philosophy of Rand Corp that then shapes everything from economic, military, cultural policy, the Vietnam War, Korean War, everything around the idea of built, using computer models around probability outcomes to justify actual real world policy right, that is which then is how we got to the had, pandemic and how we got to the to the whole thing with the imperial model that we had in the UK about how many people are going to die from covid and how that justified the policies of the lockdown and etc 
Yeah, exactly. And 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 this is what Khrushchev immediately brings in. He rehabilitates cybernetics. He also rehabilitates a whole bunch of Trotskyists and starts the de-Stalinization project in Russia to start basically saying that uh, you know, like everything that people think of as as being like why Stalin is evil today, um, in terms of the the Moscow trials that were just done to destroy his enemies, but never had any evidence that the Trotskyists ever actually had, had plenty a plenty of evidence. Plan no, with the no, they had plenty of evidence. I, we're talking about the I 1938 know. trials, yeah. Yeah, you and I, you and I know that, and, and Grover Fur's done good work to bring a lot of this stuff that's been declassified from the KGB archives to the surface. But a lot of people who are just, you know, they they're they're into the mainstream stuff, they read any Apple Apple bomb and stuff from the uh, New York Times, and that's what they that's what they are led to believe. But I mean, the reality is that um, this Khrushchev secret speech that started the destalinization thing and rewrote Soviet textbooks about how Stalin was actually this evil agency and started promoting, you know all of this, this stuff, it was, I, 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 at this point convinced that, that he was a, that, tr- that Khrushchev was a closet Trotskyist, but he then goes on and rehabilitates well, Mao, Mao cybernetics. Mao the same accusation, Matt, by the way, Mao saw the same thing and made the same accusation. Sorry, go ahead. Did he really? I want yes. to see that. That's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I yes. really want to see that. Cool. Uh, that, that, uh, okay. That's so interesting. So anyway, yeah, like then Khrushchev, he gives um, a 1960, speech to the Politburo describing how cybernetics is going to be the master key that will, that he wants to bring into every department of the Soviet bureaucracy and to shape foreign policy, domestic policy, everything. And he, he gives this whole like ejaculatory speech on cybernetics, which is disgusting. And I think that's part of why Brezhnev finally was able to organize something to push back against him. Not, but it was still too rigid. Like the, the, the cybernetics cultists were, became increasingly influential both within the United States through these think tanks, even though Kennedy tried pushing back against them, but it also became very influential in Russia during this during the Cold War. And this guy Bertrand Russell is just everywhere, you know, like this guy is like organizing the Pugwash conference around the same period after the Soviets developed the nuclear uh nuclear bomb. And he's organizing in Quebec with the Soviet uh, diplomats, also through the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, another think tank from Austria that has a huge amount of influence in Moscow during this time, he's in, he's creating a new sort of agreement around which uh, industrial and technological progress is going to be de-emphasized in favor of a parity system of mathematical balance of terror, where every new innovation on the one side will always have to be met by some innovation on the on the other side of the Iron Curtain. Um, in order to create sort of a parity of mathematical balance around which the British are able to then use the the insanity, the bipolar insanity of the Cold War, to reconquer and take control using their fifth columnists of things like the United States, of Europe, of and this is where you have the, you know, everything is justified. Every act of evil becomes a good in terms of the utilization of Nazi stay-behinds, Italian fascist stay-behinds under Operation Gladio. That's a part of the NATO a, a, a secret army operation run by Nazis that um, occurs under the umbrella of NATO that works that that runs terrorist cells all across the world um, from like the Red Brigades. Huh? No, I was going to say it would be Leon Trotsky and works like Results and Prospects that actually uh, called for the United States of Europe. Did. Dude, Leon, I'm taking note yeah. of what you're saying right now, but between like Mao calling out Khrushchev as Trotsky, so now what you're saying about Trotsky actually calling for the United States of Europe, that yeah. falls in exactly with the pan Europa Kudenhova Kalergi idea. Because Kudenhova Kalergi is the is the actual godfather of the European Union with the idea of a United States of Europe. Yeah. Right. That Churchill and, and Oswald Mosley become devotees of as well and, and, and advocates yeah, and of. We do, and we already established the Mosley Trotsky connection. So yes, it's all very clear. Fantastic stuff, man. I, and Trotsky openly called for that too. That's, I'd love to get that. Please send me, please, I'm going to write to you Absolutely. to bug you to send me yeah, that, no, that, that, bug that, me about that. Yeah, I have it here. Yeah, it's on my fingertips. We're right here. Okay. So good. Fantastic. Fantastic. So that's it. And I mean, like at the end of the day, that, that's their, that's their thing is they, they did this in terms of like Pierre Liet Trudeau, right? Who worked, who was a student, um, kind of like the way Nor- Norbert Wiener was one of, uh, Russell's boys in Cambridge. Pierre Elliott Trudeau and Kissinger were both boys of William Yandel Elliott, the Rhodes Scholar in Harvard, um, as, as was Zbigniew Brzezinski, um, as was Samuel P. Huntington a little bit later. Um, and Pierre Elliott Trudeau gives a speech in, um, in 
um, Ontario in 1969 at a liberal convention saying that cybernetics is the command and control, the, the, the key to solving all of the world's problems for his, what he calls his just society reforms. This is, and this is what oversees the, um, the technocratic revolution in Quebec in 1960, 61. Otherwise, Quebec, Quebecois are told that it was the quiet revolution. It was actually a, a technocratic overhaul of Quebec that was later replicated on the federal level in 1970, 71, 72. Um, it's what oversaw the martial law, right? We had tanks running on the streets of Montreal. And, I, and we go through this in our video, the, the new documentary, how the, how this, this cybernetics branch, this, this grouping, um, in, in Ottawa around Pierre Elliott Trudeau were organizing the, the, the special operations division of the RCMP that controlled, just like Gladio operations in Europe controlled the Maoist Leninist terrorist groups of the Red Brigades operating in Italy and France. The years of lead, r- launching terrorist like bombs in public squares and malls and schools right. and killing right. targeted people. Um, the same thing was happening in Quebec with the Front de Libération de Quebec. The same thing was happening in, in the United States with the Weather Underground, nominally Maoist, Leninist, anti-imperialist. In reality, totally handled by the FBI and uh, and special intelligence agencies to justify a climate of terror to keep the population both afraid and in the embrace of their protective captured governments. That yeah, would you then had give the, them the kidnapping of Patty Hearst. You had the Symbionese Liberation Army. You had Ben Sedemos. Everywhere, right? And right, right. Jesuits play a weird role in this stuff too, but uh, that's a side note. Now, in the case of, of Quebec, you know, we had martial law, the first Emergency Measures Act that was used in 1970, the killing, the murder of the deputy pr- premier, uh, Pierre Laporte, who was probably uh, one of the last real Christian, you know, humanist leaders in government at the time of uh, that that happened, who was resisting some of this overhaul, the Darwinian infusions into our school system. Um, Quebec was still, you know, it still had a Catholic sort of morality to it, like a Christian morality to it that wasn't right, taken right, over. Very by heavily. Yep. Um, so there was still, an, an, you know, one of the biggest opposition to eugenics reforms was throughout the Cold War, the organized uh, Catholic movements that would deploy activists into Kentucky and to Illinois, into all into Alberta, it was really well well organized around the idea that eugenics is Satan, and we have to stop it everywhere we right. see it. <laughs> um, right. Unfortunately, that's a far cry from the current uh, Catholic Church under under the Jesuit takeover. But still, yeah, it was very, there. Very very problematic. Yeah. Well, let me say. Yeah. So um, sure. previously, we were talking about how, for example, we could look at a car accident. And we could get all this data and information about it, all this linear information about velocity, rate of speed, the every every piece of data about every nut and bolt inside of the car and the rate of the speed, the angle of the collision, stuff like that, right? And that's a totally different question from why did the guy run over the girl, right? Oh, he they were in a bizarre love triangle and you know, blah, 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 blah. Okay. So one is a is a is basically we live in a world of ideas, and we live in a world driven by us human beings as as moral, ethical beings, right? And a lot of the what what you get with these deterministic models, with these linear models, with these cybernetic models, a very you can almost use those terms interchangeably. These technocratic models is it's trying to make something which for for thousands of years have been understood as moral questions, ethical questions, and make them to be, oh, no, this is a mathematical question, not an ethical question. And by doing that kind of switch from how versus why, or to do that kind of switch from, you know, what should we be doing, not what some model says is inevitably going to happen, but what ought we be doing is it is meant to remove human agency, an agency that's endowed by the creator that was given to us, that we have as a faculty, noose, et cetera, and instead make these into formulas, which you cannot argue that two plus two is four, and you cannot argue that you have to lock down for two weeks or take the jab. Well said, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you get people like, nodding their head on one point of linear uh, truth. And then all of a sudden you impose uh, that same logic onto something that is incommensurable. It, it, that type, the type of logic used for the two plus two equals four is incommensurable to um, 
why, you know, human beings, why, why are human beings not monkeys? You know, like mathematically, one might say, well, we weigh a similar weight. You know, we have right. similar atomic structure, similar yeah, DNA. percent the same genes or whatever. Yeah. All this stuff. Yeah. So you're like, well, we're mathematically equivalent, identical to monkeys. But then it's like, well, but what is, what's, what's, what's separating us? What's, what's, what is it just like that we have a slightly bigger pre like frontal cortex? Is that the only thing that sep- that differentiates us? And if monkeys words, has is it just a quantitative bigger, difference? Yeah, like is it is it just that or no? I mean, it, it's actually it's something that is that is meta metaphysical. It, it's it's this question of free will, of conscience, of the ability to conceptualize that which is not using an, an educated imagination, which can right. see into the past that I didn't personally experience or into the future after which I might even be dead, but I could still imagine futures that um, are better or worse. And then the question right. becomes, as far as animating my decision-making is, well, what do I want to devote my time and energy to? What do I value um, within within the context of the small period of time I am allotted that, that allows me to judge what is probable or what is possible and what is necessary, right? Those are the two, the two standards that we, we can really use. And there aren't really more when thinking about the future is like, well, what are possible futures and also yeah. what are necessary futures? And sometimes what is possible is not necessary. Like, you know, I can, I can possibly shut down the carbon economy of the world. Is it necessary? Well, if I believe that human beings are just monkeys that can that cannot discover anything qualitatively new, but but just extract limited resources in a world of diminishing returns like other animals do, then maybe I, I would have to say it's necessary that we reduce uh, we 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 reduce the human population to better conform to the limits of of nature that are imposed upon us. Maybe that would be the case. But if I think that well, human beings are actually these beautiful beings made in the image of God with an immortal soul that can self-reflect and act with conscience to discover and love truth and love ourselves and love God and creation and discover creation by leaping over the limits to growth when we're creative in a, in that specific kind of way, then more babies means more problem solvers because the world right. is always going to have problems. One. Yeah. And, and exactly. And so every baby becomes a blessing and and having more people is a good thing because you're like, okay, that's more artists, more geniuses, more, more ideas that can be generated willfully by, by these beautiful monads, um, made in the image of God. And so babies are no longer pollution, you know, like the, right. the materialist would, would have us believe. And each so human being, each human being is, is capable is, is and we're unique each human being is capable of providing geometrically more than they consume. Totally, totally. Yeah. I mean, and you can't even imagine like, cause people would say like, Oh, the, the, the world pre Ben Franklin's discovery of electricity and post his discovery still used like money. There was still money in circulation. So, right. Did it just create more ability to make money happen or what? But it's like, no, the, the, the quality of the world in which the money was circulating post discovery of electricity and its application in the productive process was a qualitatively different world. But the, but looking at the money by itself would not give you insight into the qualitative transformation that occurred in physical space time, right. mental physical space time of the re, of reality. Um, the buying power of money was different. The, the what right. it could do, the role it did, as far as supporting, uh, a, 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 like human beings, uh, was was incommensurably different. Qualitative so our, our, different. Yeah, qual- yeah. We could live longer, higher quality lives, have more of us uh, with more access to our mental powers after the application, the occurrence number one, and then the application of those uh, discoveries. Um, and this is something that the Club of Rome freaks around Alexander King all have always been trying to undermine and destroy from within by by putting mathematical binary computing systems onto the mapping of of everything in the world from both like ecologies but also whole the whole universe. They they've been and Bertrand Russell has had said early on and in innumerable locations, as had Norbert Wiener, that the only law of the universe that has that is constant is the second law of thermodynamics entropy. 
and they, they, they both speak so highly throughout so many of the writings of the belief in the immutability of entropy as something we all must assume to be absolutely true, the way that, that Clausius uh, formulated this for the, for the Royal Society back in 1865. Mm-hmm. Um, again, Royal Society, right? All these, all the most garbage ideas come come out of the British. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but what is what is entropy? It's just this idea that the universe is a closed system, the whole universe, right? Not that we've right. ever seen anything more than a tiny little sliver of a sliver of a sliver of the universe that we were created into. But now these arrogant freaks go and take some mechanical attribute of a, of a heat engine or a, a fire which has a limited amount right. of fuel that, that will always use more fuel than it creates, thus always moving towards some form of heat death. And then they Correct. extrapolate that onto the entirety of the universe in space and in time. Thus, right. And that's where you get the second space. law of thermodynamics from. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's, it's just the, the idea of, the, of, de- of death being the ultimate principle controlling the behavior teleologically of the universe towards an ultimate big blah of coldness in the future where nothing will be anymore. And before which there was nothing that came, like all things came out of this empty void of nothingness 13.7 billion years ago, as if that were even discoverable, but it's not. Right. No, it's so ridiculous. Right. It's, a, it's an entropy driven. It's an entropy death cult. Um, Matt Arrett, Canadian Patriot Review, uh, uh, American Vagabond you're working with now, putting out documentaries. Uh, are you still doing anything with Strategic Culture Foundation? Uh, what's going Unfortunately, on? Unfortunately, to, to, I, the, the Canadian, uh, government, whatever that is, uh, went and, and sanctioned the Strategic Culture Foundations, uh, oh, ba- so they followed by, yeah, so you got the nasty letter too. All right. No, well, I we didn't get openly no, threatened the way you did. So I didn't get like uh, a 300, if I keep writing for them, I'm going to go to jail or get a $300,000 fine or something. I didn't get that, but, uh, I, I was like, no, just being on the list, the sanction list itself. Um, and I'm already on the State Department watch list. I was like, I, right. I don't need more headaches in my life. So I just was like, yeah. Let's just let's just pull back from that for a while. I lo- I love strategic culture, but um, but yeah, we're no, we're not, not going to be the same place. I, see, yeah. the thing about and I because we we just got about two minutes left, and I think when people have, have, are hearing what you're talking about, and what people need to understand, okay, is that is that um, folks like Matt and other my colleagues, we are openly persecuted researchers. Okay, so this is this is not like oh you know we got three strikes on YouTube. Our governments, uh, you know, are I wouldn't say they're after us, but they are definitely suppressing our work. They're definitely trying to put the chill on what we're doing, and they're they've got all their eyes and ears out, and they're not happy with you, man. So congratulations for earning <laughs> their ire. We've been <laughs> we've been we've been talking with um, my co- my colleague and friend. For a number of years now, Matt Arrett. Matt, it's been my pleasure to have you on. Any final thoughts as as we say goodbye? No, dude, and a big congratulations to you too. You're uh, you're, you're doing God's work, Joaquin. And uh, no, I mean, I think look, if people want to, actually, one thing I would say is, if I, I would like this new video that we did to go as viral as possible. So I, I need help. If people are able to just watch the video, watch it again, share it with friends, and really just help amplify it however you can on social media or anything else, do watch parties, and discuss some of the content of – I mean, we're bringing a lot into that discussion about is did China interfere in the Canadian elections? Well, why did Nazis take over control of the world after World War II, right? <laughs> like, right, right, um, right. right. So have a conversation. Help me spread it. And, uh, and yeah, thank you, Joaquin. I was, I was, I was love these platforms and chatting with you. Brother, it's been my pleasure. Uh, Matt Arrett, uh, speaking with you again. I hope to have you on again soon. Thanks so much for being with us, Matt. Take care. Bye. So that we've been talking to Matt, and uh, that is our show for today, folks. Uh, XF live stream uh, sometimes gets heavy. Sometimes it's easy. We have tons of ideas. Yeah, this is going to go up on the drive. So there was a lot of information in there, a lot of names, dates, concepts, ideas. The cool thing is that on the drive, you can go get it. You can push it out. Also, though, he talks and writes about this stuff all over his own materials. He's got a number of documentaries out. He's got uh, – he writes on this regularly. Um, and uh, I'm going to share – I guess – Well, so we shared the video. We're going to share it again. There's also a couple of Telegram channels that uh, you can talk to – people in his circle and people he works with. Also, uh, his wife does a lot of good um, material as well. She's writing a lot of good stuff, great research, many discoveries uh, being exposed. A lot of discoveries have been made and they're being suppressed. And that's a very important thing to understand that, that 
Um, even though we can make new discoveries, there's a, there are many discoveries that are already known, and they've been known for hundreds of years, and they're being suppressed because um, the truth is that the direction that science was clearly going in the 14, 15, 1600s was showing that um, the reality of God, and of course, this can be distilled through a cultural lens around the world. It's understood different ways. But the main idea that we live in a God-created realm, that this is intentional, that there are no accidents of this type on the scale, and that we are all here for a reason, has been used by the elites. They've been suppressing that so that you have this kind of ongoing state of nihilism, of despair, of uh, you're going to get the sort of this, uh, you know, you've heard it maybe even from RFK Jr. talking about uh, Camus and almost, and he's actually celebrating uh, Sisyphean nihilism of just, you know, rolling the hill up over and over and over again. And rather than that, okay, rather than that, we aren't just finding meaning in meaninglessness, okay? We are showing that the meaning is there. It is overarching, that we are born from meaning. We're not trying to create meaning, but the primary meaning, the primary mover in this universe is what gave life to all of this. And that is the main thing that they are trying to suppress so that you are disempowered, so that you are dependent, that you are depressed, you are demoralized. And when you have, when they have you in that condition psychologically, they can suggest and enforce all kinds of things that describes much of the problem that we see in the world today. And those things that we're trying to get out there are probably chiefly the reason that we're being so heavily targeted and, uh, and censored and repressed by the governments uh, w from whom we still have our passports, I'm going to say. But no, I am an American. I'm proud enough of that fact. I'm not very proud of a lot of things that have been done in my country's name. And I don't live in the United States. Um, but I will say that I still have hope, and I have, I think, reasonable hope. Um, I'm seeing people wake up every day. I'm seeing change happening at the local level, and it's small, and then all of a sudden. So I want you guys never to forget that. It's been my pleasure to be with you today, XF Livestream. Uh, we'll be with you again Monday, 1 o'clock, uh, Rome, Belgrade time. Same bat time, same bat channel. Peace, I'm out.